347 326 9741. 347 326 9741. I am Brian the Butcher Brown. Um, of course, uh, I don't think we got Dolo tonight. He has abandoned me, much like uh, our other cohort, Nick Frank, abandoned us le- last week. But speaking of Nick Frank, what's going on, huh? Yo, my man. Yeah, I think Dolo had uh, some prior engagement tonight. And uh, myself last week, I was down in the Dominican Republic in my song bikini, getting rid of all these tan lines, these pesky tan lines I've been dealing with for the last six months. Nice. So you got your base tan? You got your base tan going? Yeah, I got a little bit more of a base tan. I, uh, so we, we show up there. It was in Punta Cana. It was in the 80s and sunny every day. And uh, first day we got there in the afternoon, we just hit, you know, sat by the ocean. It was later in the day, so the sun wasn't all that strong. So I underestimated it. So I come out the next day, Friday morning, and I tell myself, <laughs> you know, I'm not wearing any sunblock. I'll just I'll go without the sunblock for the morning, sure. and we'll go eat lunch, and then... Uh, in the afternoon, I'll, I'll wear my sunblock and we'll be all good. So I was out laying by the pool from about 10 in the morning till about noon and uh, burned the shit out of myself and I was burned for the rest of the vacation. I'm actually still peeling as you see right now. It's oh, so beautiful, good. beautiful. So you spent uh, your whole vacation in pain, I see, right? It had to be fucking hideous. Oh, it was disgusting. I mean, it was like, I, and then I had to, you know, I had to keep reapplying the uh, the SPF every time we, literally every time we left the room. I was like, uh, you know, my face was oily because I, I, my face was burned, my neck, my arms, my chest. Oh. It was a, uh, I mean, it was a, it was a good vacation. It was, uh, you know, much needed, but I, I underestimated that uh, Caribbean sun. I'll tell you that much, power. Yeah. Yeah, believe me, I always estimate, underestimate the sun. I haven't been burned like that in a long time. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but I am rather opaque. So, really? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably, you know, if I can't ever get the chance to go away anywhere, I probably should just move north, uh, maybe head into Canada or something, because I believe, I'm not 100% sure, because I'm not sure I, if I graduated high school, but the Dominicans near the equator, am I correct about that, or am I, am I off? Um, it's, it's down in the Caribbean, like near Puerto Rico, like off of... Uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm acting like I know everything, but I actually asked my fiance on the way down there, like, where the hell, like, in the world are we? Because I didn't realize down past Florida, I guess, towards, uh, yeah. like, near uh, near Cuba. I'm sorry, not Puerto Rico, near Cuba. Okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm Puerto a little off, but it's close. It's hot. It's hot as balls there. Yeah, and I normally, I even went, uh, I'm Italian and German, so, like, I tan pretty good. But I'll normally burn one, you know, in the beginning of the summer, I'll burn one time, and then I'll, I'll tan all year long. But I always have to get through that initial burn. So I got a little metrosexual the week before I left, mm. and I went tanning for a couple sessions. I just wanted to go. <laughs> oh, and get a, I wanted to get a base, you know, oh, so I wanted to get a little God. base. So I wouldn't, so I wouldn't, uh, so I wouldn't burn. And uh, I didn't really, you know, I didn't want to burn in the tanning salon either. So I went really, you know, with pussy settings in the tanning salon. It didn't give me that much color, and I burned anyway. So. I, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I've lost some of my manhood, and I got burnt. Uh, I, I, I don't even know what to say, <laughs> that you were spending time in the tanning salon, you know, it's, uh, I don't think, it's really reason why I, it's like, when, you go, I, every, when I went in there, the first, I went twice, so the uh, first time I went in there, you know, it's like, uh, I got like a, you know, a wool hat, sunglasses, with my hood on as I'm walking in, because I don't want anybody that I know to see me walking in there. And, you know, I have to make sure that the girl at the front desk knows that I'm all man, and that's the only reason I'm going sure. tanning is uh, so that I don't burn for my vacation. So as I'm asking her advice as to, you know, what to do, i got to tell her five times that I never go tanning, and then I'm just doing this for my vacation um, to the point where, um, you know, I think I freaked her out a little bit. <laughs> I'm just doing it for the chicks. Any beds open? Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, Any that's fat, terrible. Hairy, where do fat, hairy, blue-collared men tend? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I could never go. Did you go waxing, too? Did you have to wax that body hair off? Uh, I shaved my chest just because um, it makes me makes my tits look sl- slightly smaller for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do that anymore either. I've uh, I've completely given up on myself. I certainly ain't going tanning, and uh, <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> I I do tend to burn. Like uh, when I do have work, because obviously I uh, of course I'm a grunt, I'm a blue collar guy. Sometimes I work outside, and like you, I'll forget to put the sunscreen on, so I just peel all during the summer. Like I'm probably gonna have skin cancer by the time I'm. Well, I don't want to date you, myself. You burn all year. 
like I, I, like I said, I burn that once and then I get tan. Like, do you continue? Like, once you burn, does your skin get used to it, or do you just keep burning all year long? It gets used to it a little bit because I got a little bit of German in me, dude. But uh, I'm telling you, like, when I was a kid, for some reason, I used to tan. I used to look so sexy, so molestable. I had a six pack when I was a child, and uh, I used to get real nice and dark with real blonde hair and blue eyes. And now I'm just some fat, redheaded dude who just burns his ass off all summer long, and I just my shoulders <laughs> just peel constantly. Oh, and my nose too. I look ridiculous because I have this big red nose, and then the nose just starts peeling right off my face. It's fucking horrendous. Well, I actually, I, I've seen you know some pictures. I think it was on Facebook or something when you were a little bit younger. You look a lot more Brian Dunn um, <laughs> in, your, in your younger years. I, I, I made that observation at one point. Thanks. I don't know if I ever told you that, but. Um, no, you never did, but when he died, I was thinking about maybe hitting the gym, losing a few pounds, and, and calling up. Uh, I think he had his show on G4, and I was going to try to just slide right in there because I figured I might <laughs> be able to pull it off. Yeah, actually, when he died, I thought, um, you know, the wrong red-headed uh, drunk guy. <laughs> it's just, it's like, you know, his take, beard was uh, a little take, bit more bushy. Yeah, take the butcher instead. He's got nothing to offer society. <laughs> That's so true, you know. It is a crime that he was taken from us, and I still get to walk amongst the living. So, you know, it is. A, it wasn't well, you're a, uh, a radio celebrity now, four hours a week on the radio. The, uh, you know, we've been uh, talking to some people at the company. We're we can't really get into specifics, but we're going to make some moves pretty soon. Uh, Mr. Brown headlining two shows a week, so you're on your way, my friend, to uh, Hollywood fame. Well, me and Dolo last week, we really didn't want to brag and rub it in people's faces, but we were just talking about the deal. You know, nothing too specific like you said, but obviously we were just talking about the amount of money that uh, we're just getting thrown into our pockets. And let me tell you people something. It is fucking ridiculous. And since I got two shows, I just fucking put uh, Franco and Dolo to shame. I'm just living high on the hog over here. Since you got two shows, you got to pay double. <laughs> exactly. Unfortunately, the two guys doing the show with me on Wednesday, I haven't cut them in, so don't tell them, all right? Don't let them know anything about this conversation. Okay. All right, I can keep um, <laughs> okay. you, you know, one of those guys I got no problem not telling. They used to work for free. <laughs> Listen, man, I know we can't see <laughs> each other, but I do like uh, to drink a little bit of water to keep my voice all smooth and everything like that. you got to warn me when, you, when you're going to bring that kind of stuff up. When I get racial, I'll, I'll let you know next time I... Uh, uh, I'd make a racially charged statement. We got a two-hour show. Right? There's only two of us, so at any point, I might just uh, just jump into a racial tirade just to uh, just to get the shock value up for the show to get to get the bug going. <laughs> Speaking of being racial, did you see that one of your people? I was going to save this for Wednesday's show if we didn't hit it tonight because I figured uh, we could use it to talk about. It. But did you see one of your people uh, fought on the strike force card on the undercard on uh, on Saturday night? Who? Uh, what's his name? Uh, Sailing. Hold on one second. Let me get his full name because I didn't, uh, I'm not prepared. I don't have my paper open. So it's just like school. Hold on one second. <laughs> his name is, uh, Brandon Sailing. And, uh, there's a big hullabaloo. Now, I do have issue with it myself. Um, but I'll give you my, my reasoning. But apparently he is a, uh, a white power, uh, skinhead. He has, uh, all types uh, okay. of, uh, you know, I know the guy, I know the guy you talking about now. Yeah, I saw that fight. Yeah, so were you rooting for him hardcore? I wasn't. You know, I didn't know his uh, political and uh, socio, uh, you know, <laughs> socio uh, agenda. But uh, the kid was a good, a good scrapper. But how did they not even? That was the kid. They said he had fought like two weeks prior, so I think it's, he was just a re- late replacement. He was a local fighter, um, but he's like legitimately uh, part of the, the the white power movement. You say? <laughs> Absolutely. He's got the uh, eighty-eight on his shoulder with the two lightning bolts. So that's. Uh, you know, 8-8, eight, eight, sail Hitler, and the two lighting bolts represents the SS. So, I mean, the guy's yeah. definitely dedicated. And he's got a tattoo across his stomach that says white steel, which is, I don't know, kind of ballsy, I'm going to say, you know. Yeah, but, uh, kind of, I mean, was there, like, was this reported on? Did you read that somewhere? These are just observations that you made. Well, no, these, are, these would have been observations that I, that I would have made if I would have seen the guy with a shirt off. I only seen a picture of his face. But uh, this was definitely reported on, and he's currently, uh, the Athletic Commission's investigating him now. Well, I brought him up, but I said I somewhat agree with it because obviously, you know, uh, we do live in a free country, so if the guy wants to choose that to be what he believes in, fine, you know. But, of course, everybody's yeah. making a hot blue about his tattoos. But apparently, in 2005, he was involved in a rape. Now, I know you went off on the Green Bay Packers uh, assistant coach's son, and you didn't have any facts whatsoever. You were calling him a pedophile. But this guy was actually exactly. convicted of rape uh, against a 13-year-old girl. So that's the Whoa. thing that really slipped through the cracks that kind of really puts uh 
strike force, and obviously Zuffa, since they own him, in a bad position for not really doing a background check on this guy. Obviously, everybody's bringing up the racial issues, but I, I think that's kind of a moot point when you factor that in. Yeah, no, I agree. I think, like you said, uh, we make jokes in here. I obviously I don't agree with that shit, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that that guy doesn't have the right to believe what he wants to believe as long as right. that doesn't hurt people. Or you know, it's it's just a matter of opinion or you know prejudice, whatever it may be. But it's not against right. the law to believe something. But uh, you know, uh, that's absurd. That I, I you know I guess the excuse is going to be that that you know they had to turn him around quickly and he was a late replacement. But you got to do especially. Most fighters are just athletes, and they're just regular guys, and uh, a lot of them have college degrees, but there's a certain type of person that it takes to be a fighter, so especially a guy that looks like that and sort of has that sort of uh, disposition, you figure they want to run a quick background check on him. I mean, you know, they run background checks to, to do, to get most jobs. Uh, I had to go, uh, I got my insurance licenses in, in several different states. Back, you know, background checks for almost everything. It's like a couple-day turnaround to get those results. It's just sort of amazing that they just signed this guy on a whim for a fight and they don't do any sort of background check. This guy with, you know, a mohawk, tattoos, and, uh, you know, a background in white supremacy. You figure they run a quick check on that guy. Well, absolutely do. First off, how I would rant... How would he out of jail if he raped a 13-year-old in 2005? Well, I, I, I forget the exact charge. Uh, he actually, I mean, he, he perpetrated. He didn't actually like rape the girl himself physically, but he was there menacing and threatening her to carry out uh, oh, okay. The, no, the actual like his friend, or something. but since she's on, since she's 13, it does get listed as a rape charge because obviously he was coercing, he was threatening physical harm if she didn't follow through with the other guy, and uh, I, I guess that's why he's out. I, I didn't, uh, I, I forgot to look up the other guy's name to see if he was still in jail because if he's not, then I don't know. You know, that's obviously a fucking. First off, it's crazy that this guy's walking around because he's listed on. Uh, I think he's from Ohio, to be quite honest, and I think. Yeah. Uh, He's listed in in police files, you know, with a couple of felonies and listed as highly dangerous. So it wouldn't probably wouldn't have taken too long for a strike force if they ran a slight background check to find this stuff out about this guy. Like I said, the the tattoos to me are a moot point. I don't agree with them that you know, obviously, you know, he's he's a fucking crazy person and and a shithead for that. But everybody's entitled to believe what they want to believe. But the fact of the matter to menace, you know, anybody, especially uh, uh, children. Now that's an issue and that's something that, you know. <sighs> Even even a slight background check, I think he's going to be red flagged immediately. So, like you said, he was a late fighting replacement, but you got to you got to do these checks because, especially with the, where the MMA is right now, with the way Zufa is really putting in the limelight, they don't need these kind of uh, uh, stories breaking out and making them really look like fucking savages. Yeah, totally. I, I think you're spot on. It gives the sport a bad name because, like I was saying earlier, I think the majority of uh, guys that fight MMA, especially now, are college wrestlers and college athletes, and they could do other things if they chose to. This is just what they like to do. Um, you know, especially, I, I, I would, it would make more sense to me if Strike Force was still running on, you know, previous ownership because it was sort of a smaller operation with not as much uh, financial backing and, and all that. But now that Zufa has control of it, which is a, you know, multi, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars probably the company's worth between the UFC and the Fertitta brothers above and beyond that with the casinos and everything. It's just bad business, I think. It's, you know, to hastily want to get uh, a replacement fighter and not do the things that they need to do to, to ensure, um, you know, themselves, it, it, that's just bad business. Absolutely. I'm sure there were a shit ton of dudes at, at 155 who would love to have fought on a strike force card. So Yeah, and that like, was good. Like, I mean, the actual, the undercard itself, um, they showed it on Showtime Extreme, which is like Showtime 3. There's some great fucking fights on the undercard. Um, that was a great fight. Roger Bowling was uh, a big favorite. The more technical guy looked like the, you know, sort of fat boy, you know, good muscular body, you know, like like the, mm. like the, you know, <laughs> what I'm trying to say, he was like a guy who went to the good school and played college sports and all this other shit, and this other kid, um, you know, Brandon Fallon, looked like he, they literally, he literally fought to each other, he didn't even train MMA. Like he would just basically take a fight every couple of weeks and just go in and like trial, you know, trial by by fire. And just sure. uh, the first round was good. They were exchanging some big punches. It was it became a slugfest. And uh, if uh, you know Brandon Selly didn't, uh, if he didn't gas out because he really doesn't train MMA, he probably he was probably going to win that fight. And the, the reason he lost was because he gassed and Bowling was able to control him on the ground. But 
that was actually a really good fight. It's sort of disappointing to hear that because I wanted to see that child molester fight again. <laughs> well, you know, listen, that child molester has no excuses because the one thing I do know about those guys, they're always supposed to be ready to rock at a moment's notice. So sailing has no reason no, and excuses for gassing, okay, because he should be training around the clock because you never know when the race war is going to begin. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's true. It can, it can happen at any time. I agree. Uh, exactly. So when the shit hits the fan, you got to be ready. you got to be ready. Yeah, and uh, did you see um... – I know that uh, you don't have showtime because you're a poor bastard, but did you see, yes. obviously you saw the main card. Were you able to watch the undercard, or you didn't get a chance to see it? I just missed the uh, the Kaufman fight. I, was, I went over to, uh, uh, to Dean's parents' house. I heard it was fucking amazing. These two yeah, brothers were just was, going back and forth. Yeah, that was a really good fight. and uh, it, They had fought, I think, in 2006. Or, or it, was, it, was out, it was Alexis Davis' Alexis Davis's debut. And, uh, you know, Kaufman, a lot of people thought that Rousey sort of jumped her for the title shot because Rousey had all this buzz around her and she did a lot of talking. And Kaufman is the consensus, you know, a lot of people think she might be the best 135 pounder in the world. And everybody just sort of thought this was kind of a tune up fight and she was going to definitely win this fight easily and get the winner. And she, you know, the first round, Kaufman was definitely getting the better of the stand up. Um, great technical boxing, one of the most technical female fighters that I've seen in a while. Um, whereas her, you know, technique was really solid, and she was sort of picking Alexis Davis apart. As the fight went on, Alexis Davis sort of made it more of a brawl, and Coffin wasn't really able to finish her. I think she she broke her nose, she cut her above her eye, but Davis just started brawling, and uh, you know, the second and third rounds were just really, really entertaining. Um, you know, I think Coffin definitely deserved the 29-28 uh, win that the judges gave her, but uh, a lot of people in the crowd were going for. for uh, Rooting for Alexis Davis, probably because she was the underdog and because she came back in the fight, um, you know, which is sort of, I, you know, when you watch a fight, it, it seems like a lot of times the fighter that, that wins that third round convincingly, they're the ones that win the crowd over, but I think the two rounds to one was a fair decision for Kaufman, and uh, Alexis Davis looked good. It was the, maybe the most entertaining fight of the entire night. The crowd was on its feet. And, uh, you know, I, guess I love a good women's fight, man. It's just, it has a different feeling, especially when they aren't really mixing it up. And, uh, you know, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big women's MMA guy. No, I, I, I gotta agree with you, dude. Like, uh, you know, not not to bring up the Wednesday show two weeks ago. Uh, that's kind of what we uh, we focused on the fact that that Invicta promotion and stuff is starting up, and uh, I think it's a positive thing. And I think. You know, basically my, my opinion on, on the whole strike force thing is I think if Zufa wants to be serious, I think they should scrap the men and, and really start trying to sign <laughs> high-level women's talent and, and bring it over there because uh, I think Saturday night proved that they can definitely do a, a, an exciting show with them, headlining. And I'm, I'm pissed I missed the Kaufman fight uh, because, like I said, the first thing I, when I walked into the, to where I went to go watch the fights, the first thing I heard was like, oh, these two chicks were fucking you know, out of control. It was a great fight. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, well, this just sets up uh, a letdown for later because before we get into the breakdown of the fight, I, I definitely – I gave Ronda Rousey her props last week, and I, and I said I wouldn't be shocked if Rousey pulled up, but I thought she was still a little green and that uh, a girl with the experience of Tate would uh, be able to neutralize a lot of things. And, and I definitely was wrong, but, but I figured before we get into that, we should definitely get into the breakdown of the fantasy totals because now – I have to hear how bad I got my ass whooped, and I am curious. And before we start talking about sexy Misha Tate and extraordinarily uh, hot uh, Ronda Rousey, uh, I, I would love to hear the breakdowns of the fantasy totals. Yes, sir. Um, I actually, I'm surprised I didn't leave with this. I wasn't even thinking about it. Me and you were having such a good time chatting. Uh, before I get into that really quickly, fucking Ronda Rousey, we, we need to sort of... Uh, maintain some sort of integrity on the show because it's yeah. you know somewhat of a professional show we're talking about MMA but she looks good man she right you know she, 135 pounds suits her body very well she looks she's like a little bit manly and chubby at 145 135 she was like a, oh she she looked awesome like Dude, a couple times outfit, uh, when they were scrambled the outfit was great it was ridiculously awesome it was ridiculously that, awesome when, I mean it was yeah really sexy uh, but <laughs> I digress so where we were, we were at, we uh, so we had two events this weekend. Um, the first event on Friday night obviously was the UFC on Fox event, and the second event was the Strike Force event. So going in to the weekend, I'm going to give the totals going into the weekend. I'm going to give the totals for each event and then the totals now. So going into the weekend, um, 
I have UFC Japan was the first event, right? No, it was uh, UFC on FX. Oh, well, we reviewed that last week, remember? Okay, UFC so on FX that was the first event in this new block, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. So after that event, going into this weekend, I had 26, Dolan had 22, and Dubs had 17. So Friday night was the UFC on Fox card. I'm sorry, the UFC on FX card. Um, first place for that card, uh, Dolan was three out of five for 17 points. Uh, Mr. Three Dubs, you were, you were two three out, out of five. I'm sorry, three out of four. I apologize. Um, no, no, no. Three out of no four. That was officially ruled a draw, the Demetrius Johnson thing. No, 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 no. No. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah, look it up. No, 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 no. Johnson so, won, dude. No, he didn't. They they, re, they they took it back after they, they re- revealed the controversy. It was officially ruled a draw in the record book. Wait a second. What 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 controversy? The, the controversy with Demetrius Johnson. Wait, well, what happened? With I'm Demetrius lost. Johnson? Yeah. They lost. I'm to- you're talking about the, the – Ian, you said Dolan went three for four on that uh, card on effects, and Demetrius Johnson initially was ruled that he beat Ian McCall, but – when, yeah. they, when they talked to the press conference and said how they, the judges fucked up, they changed it in the record books. So uh, they, they, they messed up on the on the card or something? Yeah, they messed up on the card. It was supposed to be a draw, and oh, what happened okay. was the guy, the head of the athletic commission, came out in the press conference and admitted that he uh, didn't look at the judges' score properly and then ruled it in favor of Johnson, and it was wrong. Uh, okay, I got you. Uh, yeah. give me I'm one sorry. Second. I guess I should have. When I spoke to you briefly this afternoon, I just I, I forgot to mention it to you. I'm I'm sorry. No, it's okay. You know, I was I've been busy working shit, so I didn't see that. So that's good. Uh, let me just adjust the scores really quickly. Uh, 30, okay, great. So that puts uh, Dolan uh, even skinnier position. All right, that's, I'm happy about that. We'll talk about that soon. But so Dolan. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I should have so, told you before. I apologize. No, no problem. It's my own fault for not doing any research for the show. That's Mr. usually Dubs. me, but this time I did because I didn't want Dolan getting those fucking points. That's why the only reason why I looked it up. Uh, Mr. Dubs, two out of four for 12 points. Uh, and then myself and Dolan, both two out of four for 10 points. So after two events, after Friday night, um, I was in first place with 36 points. Mr. Dolan was in second place with 32 points. And you were in Ooh. third place with 29 points. So that was after right, two events. Bad. Okay. Going into Saturday, it was it was a it was a close race. All three of us were somewhat close. I had thought that Dolan was up, but I guess I had made that mistake. But I mean, Saturday night, I mean, talk about the cream rising to the top and <laughs> when the chips are all on the table, when when it really counts, you know, it's just it, it's almost it's almost absurd at this point. So let's go over the total for Saturday night. Just yeah, just this is a big one. Uh, I'm upset that Dolan's not here because. Uh, I know that he started the season off strong. I know he was feeling good about himself. He was texting me a little bit about it. But, um, so, Mr. Dubs, one out of five for five oh, points. Jesus. Possibly the worst showing ever for a major card. We'll have to go back and do the research. Uh, Mr. Dolan, um, delicious. I'm assuming this is why he's not on the show tonight. One yeah, out that's of five. The real one out of five for seven fantasy points. Oh. And myself, the three time reigning champion. As I always say, like the Bulls in the mid '90s, repeating all day long. <laughs> Four out of five fights correctly for 29 points. So oh, after three events, here are the totals. Third place, Mr. Butcher, 34 <laughs> fantasy points. Oh, With an man. average, uh, I'm going to average that out really quickly because I'm a math guy. So three events, you got 34 points. You're averaging about 11 points an event. We got to get that number oh, up. Oh God, a little um, bit more. Second place, uh, delicious one, Mr. Dolan, 39 points. And first place with an absolutely commanding lead after, <laughs> after three events. Myself, 65 fantasy points. Holy so, shit, this, this is going to be tough. It's 65, 39, 34. I almost got you doubled up. Three more points and I'm doubling you up right now. Oh, Jesus. Dude, that gets me. <laughs> not a good thing. I should have fucking... I don't know why I had to back, uh, back my boy Noons. The, him and his beautiful hair always gets me, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, Strike Force is Strike Force is my bread and butter. I love a, I love a good Strike Force event. <laughs> Which one did you get wrong? The Paul Daly Masaki fight? Yeah, the Paul. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, everybody got that, that one wrong because nobody saw that coming. But uh, no. yeah, this is pretty devastating news, Franco. Because I mean, I know I made an amazing comeback last year because I was trailing in third forever, and you only beat me by one point. But like you said, this is fucking. This is a huge lead already. I don't, I don't know. I'm getting nervous already. Yeah. When I mean, fantasy baseball start? Because uh, I might as well give this oh, shit up. Dude, I talked to uh, 
we're getting off track here, but I talked to Dom today. He's not running the league. What? Dom, Dom is not running baseball. He said, like, uh, some fucking, some jack-off stiffed him last year. He didn't get paid by everybody, so he's like, he's not looking for the stress. He's getting into uh, uh, some, one of, somebody else that we know. G-Doc's running the league, so he's getting into that. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to, you know. I don't know if I'm going to go with the G Docs running the league. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't want to create any controversy. I know we're heard in a major, a major all over the place in a lot of households. So I don't want to start any static here. But uh, I ain't going to be in a league that G Docs in charge of. I'm just saying oh, that right shit. now. Um, <laughs> I can't wait for the league brutal draft. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this tape. <laughs> Please do because I don't know. I've heard he can get real catty and stuff in his other baseball leagues, so it gets really heated and shit. So I, I can't deal with that kind of crap. You know? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm looking around right now for another league, but uh, yeah, no, uh, no, no league from the commission this year. He's uh, he's near right now. I'm so, I'm so used to Dom being our commission that uh, just in protest, you know, uh, it's just in protest. I can't sign up, but like you said, I guess we're getting off topic, so we'll jump in. I know you picked this title fight correct, and uh, <clears throat> like I said last week, I certainly uh, gave Ronda her praises and shit, and I said I wouldn't be surprised, but I just thought the experience of Tate would uh, would really rise to the top here. I mean, she's she's a veteran in the sport, but uh, Ronda Rousey's no joke. Obviously, the main event pitted Misha Tate and Ronda Rousey for the women's bantamweight title of Strike Force, and uh, impressive performance, dude. I am now... 100% a true believer. I, I was on the fence that, wanting to lean over into Rousey's yard last week, and now I'm fully in her, in her backyard, and I, I don't think I'm going to leave. I'm not going to leave, but I want to hear what your feelings were on this fight, dude. Yeah, I'm fully aroused myself. I mean, um, yeah. I'm fully a believer. Now, the, uh, you know, Misha <laughs> Tate's probably a better overall fighter than, than Rousey, but it was obvious, I think, during the fight that Rousey was a lot stronger. She probably... Oh, yeah had, you know, not to say Misha Tate didn't have any technique uh, as far as grappling on the ground, but you could tell Rousey had better technique and she was stronger. Now, Misha Tate sort of, you know, bull rushed her in the beginning and she did land, you know, a good punch or two, which I think was going to be her only shot was to either stop her quickly with punches or at least, you know, shake her up a little bit and get her off her game. But, um, you know, I think, like we say all the time and like Dana White always says, the division's not deep enough. Uh, women's MMA in general is not deep enough in, to say, I think that Ronda Rousey, if a, an elite-level striker with some good defensive grappling were to face her, they would give her a lot of problems because I think going into that fight, she'd only thrown like four or five strikes in her entire career. And Absolutely. And you could tell she just wanted to grab a hold of Misha and bring her to the ground, and Misha was able to land a few punches on her. Once she gets a hold of you, though, you're in a lot of trouble. I think that there are holes in her game, but I don't think that, you know, it's just not deep enough for somebody to be skilled enough to sort of exploit what her holes are. So I think at least for the mm. next couple fights, mm. you can have Sarah Kaufman, who's a really solid boxer, but I still think that Rousey's going to be able to get her to the ground. Um, you know, I, I'd love to see her fight Cyborg Sanchez. So that's the fight that I would love to see. I you know, like I'm not sure too. if Cyborg gets off, gets off the juice or she's still the same fighter, but, I mean, that's the fucking matchup you want to see. Um, you know, Misha Tate, again, uh, another rematch would be good. But once Rousey got a hold of her and, you know, Misha, uh, Rousey got her arm, she didn't have it all the way sunk in, and then Misha was able to sort of get her back. But even at that point, you never really felt like Rousey was in any danger. It felt like it was a matter of time. You know, I'm watching that fight thinking, you know, Tate would be lucky to get out of his first round. You know, once again, it's a disorder like that with a, with a, with a grappler like Ronda Rousey. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of time. And the women are a lot more flexible. Their jiu-jitsu is more fluid. They can pull submissions from different positions than men can because they're less muscular and because they can pin their heel bar in their ears and guys can't. So, you know. <laughs> well, some guys can. Some guys can. Yeah, anyway, exactly. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I love to watch the jiu-jitsu of women just because they're a lot more flexible, so they can do more things. They can pull off, you know, uh, a stranger position and pull a submission out of there, so you mm -hmm. never really know what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, Rousey... Uh, was very impressive, and I, I love to watch her fight, and I sort of feel, felt bad for Misha Tate. Um, I don't really know why, because I feel that she was saying the right things. She was sort of representing. She was trying to represent women's MMA the right way, and saying this girl's got a big mouth, and she's just coming in, and I worked my way up. But, I mean, the long and short of it was that she just wasn't good enough. Rousey was just better. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and like Billy beat me to the punch already. I was going to say, I bet that twink on Tufts could uh, get his, his uh, legs between it, behind his ears. But anyway, um, that's besides <laughs> the point. Uh, <laughs> no, I agree with a lot of things you said, dude. Rousey was really impressive. And uh, I, I think the problem mainly for Misha, and, and I'm not taking anything away from Rousey because after, uh, uh, you know, like I said, I'm totally on, on the Rousey train now. I, I definitely am after seeing that fight. Um, but I think Misha definitely – you know, she had the advantage on the feet, but I don't think she was smart about it. I think if she would have been a little bit more relaxed and picked her spots better and not getting t- got too close and overcommitted, uh, she might have been able to pick her apart more. And, uh, you know, she needed to be more relaxed up there because the one thing you don't want to do is ever get off balance against uh, a judo player, especially one with her credentials. She's a bronze medal in the Olympics. She's a fourth-level Dan in, in judo. So once she gets a hold of you, you're in a lot of fucking trouble. You know, it's going to be really hard to regroup, get your legs under you. I mean, it was very easy for her to trip Misha, get her down once uh, Misha w- was was in the pocket. And then and, and, and once she committed, like you said, she did tag Rousey a couple times. But... You know that that was that was it. Uh, Rousey got the body lock, or or just side can, uh, grabbed her by the side and then just tripped her down to the ground. Um, you know it was impressive that Misha had 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 the guts and, and was tough enough to to get out of that first armbar. But that first armbar was really deep. I mean, it looked like the the elbow almost dislocated, if not already did a lot of damage. So I, I mean, you got to give her props there. She got out of it. Um, of course, after the fight, Rousey said she really didn't think she had it anyway. It wasn't tight enough, but. You know, once, once, like you said, even though Misha got her back later on in the fight and everything, uh, I, I felt the same way as you. I felt it was a matter of time before Rousey was going to get her back in a bad position and, and pull off a submission, let alone another arm bar. And, of course, she isolated the same exact arm, and uh, she went for it and just kept cranking it. And, dude, it was fucking brutal. It was one of the worst arm bars I think I've ever seen anybody pull off. You know, it, it, it bent all the way backwards and immediately just started to discolor. It was it was brutal. And, you know, again, I, I give Misha Tate a lot of credit. She's a tough girl for not tapping uh, right away. But, you know, when you're in that deep against somebody with those kind of credentials, you know, she's had seven fights total. Uh, no, eight fights now, three amateur, all in the first round, arm bar, and now five uh, 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 pro fights, one for the title now, all arm bar. If you're, if you're in that kind of position against this girl, you got to just fucking tap. I mean, give, give it a chance to get out, but once you're that, that deep, it, it's over. But, you know, it's going to be an interesting fight against Kaufman. Um, I, I know you touched on it a little bit. I think Kaufman is probably in a lot of trouble. You know, she is a better boxer than Tate. But uh, if she overcommits in any way, she's going to be in a lot of trouble, too. Um, um, I think you agree with me there. You think Rousey's going to win that fight, don't you? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I don't – you know what? In all honesty, I don't think – I think people are going to write Kaufman off. But right. I think she's got the style to, to give her some problems because she has very technical boxing. She doesn't have the greatest knockout power, but – in all honesty, there's not a, a lot of women in the world that really do. It's more of an accumulation. You don't see many one-punch knockouts in women M- women's MMA. They just don't have the power. But right. she's big. She's a big 135-pounder, and she's got decent um, striking. So, you know, I don't think that Rousey comes out, bull rushes her, and, and, and taps her out in a minute. But, well, I definitely think Rousey's going to win the fight. And I think one of the reasons that, you know, similar to Big Nog and Frank Mir. I think the fact that the build-up for this fight, the fact that these two didn't like each other, is the reason why Misha Tate didn't tap. Because Ronda Rousey said, oh, yeah. on every interview she was going to tap around the first round, Misha Tate said she wasn't. She had her in a the position. They both knew that she was done. And, you know, Tate, to her credit, she, she toughed it out. She tried to stay there as long as she could to get out of it. And, uh, you know, she, she got her elbow dislocated for oh. trouble. But the real question, Dubs, that I would ask you is, um, fuck, Mary kill. Gina Carano, Misha Tate, and Ronda Rousey. Oh, my God. Holy shit. That is a... uh, I'm going to, I think, marry Gina because she's got that movie money coming in. You know what I'm saying? She just signed another movie deal, so um, it's still... I know MMA's come a long way, but women's MMA might have gotten a step up from there. They're not getting the big paycheck, so I'm marrying Carano because I need to live on easy street. Um... (laughs) I love my girl, Misha, but unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to kill Misha to get my ass over to to, to uh, Ronda because, like you pointed out before, I know we're trying to keep professional, but she looked incredible at 135. Um, I know I was at somebody's house, and I immediately wanted to run to the bathroom 
And I, I was like, no, I can't embarrass myself like this. So I just sat there like a good gentleman and watched the fight. But uh, she's definitely pretty hardcore. I think she'd be she'd be a pretty wild chick. And she's 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 fucking mean, dude. She is mean. Yeah. So I think that all that uh, anger think, in the uh, bedroom would yeah. be sweet, you know. Good good choices on all three. I would do the same exact thing. She was on. Thank you. She has that sort of, you know, she reminds me a little bit of, like, Nick Diaz. Like, she was mean mugging during the interviews, and she was sort of talking shit the whole time. And then even after the fight, she still was kind of talking shit. Like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I don't really feel bad about it. And uh, she just sort of has that punk attitude. And I know that she trains. Uh, she doesn't come from that camp, but she trains with those guys sometimes over at Teaser Gracie. So yep. she sort of has that mentality. She was on the uh, Joe Rogan. I listen to Joe Rogan's podcast on the train sometimes. And right. uh, it's, it's really not a lot of MMA. Like, every once in a while, he'll have, like, Eddie Bravo or somebody on. But for the most part, you know, he's, like, uh, in most parts, he talks about, like, hallucin- hallucinogens and, uh, oh, you know, his yeah, liberal no. sort it's of, good. you know, it's actually a decent show. Sometimes his, his left-wing shit gets a little too much for me, and I can't listen. But he had her on <laughs> one time, and uh, she was talking about, you know, it was a good story. She talked about her life and about, you know, coming up in judo and uh, being in, she told a story about how she was in a the movie theater at one point, and it was her and her friend, and they were watching movies, and there was this, you know, group of guys behind her. Um, they might have been Steve's cousins. We'll just put it that way. And, uh, <laughs> I wonder what that means. You know, she, she, she was specific as to what ethnic group they belonged to. I know Brandon Sailing would not have, been, well, not have approved of them being in there, but go on. Doesn't really have anything to do with the story, but she did mention it, so I'm just conveying the information. I'm not okay. expecting any judgments. And uh, there was sort of an, an altercation, and she got into an There was a, a female with that group, and there was a bit of an argument, and they um, threw their shoe at her or something like that, and, and there was somewhat of an altercation, and she wound up judo tossing two of the guys and literally knocking the one guy unconscious because she judo tossed him, and he hit his head on the ground. And uh, they wound up leaving, and, like, one of these guys uh, pressed charges and sued her, and all of a sudden what? it happened uh, you know, from this fallout. Because pussy. once they, they heard afterwards, like, once they left, somebody else in the movie theater was like, that's what's her name, she's a judo Olympic medalist. So they thought they could get the money out of her. So she basically beat their ass, and then they sued her. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was sort of a – it sort of so. fits perfectly with her personality when you hear that story. Oh, yeah, the, the girl's ready to roll. I mean, I don't know. Did you watch the weigh-in when, when you know, the whole controversy that they were talking about on Saturday? When yeah. uh, Misha tried to tried to get in her face and, and put her, her forehead on hers to, as an intimidation thing, and the girl geeked. Ronda Rousey geeked. She fuck was going to go after her. She smashed her head into hers. And, I mean, like, that when they showed that clip, I, I was just like, holy shit, this girl's, I think this girl's the real deal. It ain't, it ain't all bullshit. I think the girl's yeah. definitely got a switch. And she's ready to rock when it's time. And that's why she's gonna crank that shit. So you better tap. You know what I'm saying? I think this is like the third. Isn't this the third girl in, in professional fights? And I think at least uh, uh, one of them in the amateurs that she's done some extensive damage to their arm uh, because she just fucking cranks the shit out of the thing. Yeah, it's and it's sort of you know you're put in that position. At, uh, not from experience. I've never you know I did jujitsu for about one week about nice. four or five years ago. And, right, so uh, you're, you're, you're a professional. Yeah, so I know what I'm talking about, in other words. Um, <laughs> but like I said, I, I don't know what I'm talking about, but it seems from watching, you know, thousands of fights, once you're in that position, you're fucked. So you have two yeah. choices. You can tap out or you can get your army to broker or dislocated, and you can't fault the person that has the submission hold. A lot no. of times you don't see the arm break right away. A lot of times they have a minute for five, you know, four or five, maybe six seconds, and then they crank it down because the person is not going anywhere. So... You know, it's sort of irresponsible, you know, to the sport to yourself not to tap out when you're in that position. It's hard to tell somebody that, especially there was so much talk in this fight about that arm bar. So you can't really fault Misha Tate for not no. tapping. But absolutely no, you know, uh, you know, you can't blame Ronda Rousey either. She's got her. What is she going to do? She's, you know, she's going to break her arm. Or she's going to uh, dislocate her elbow. Misha Tate, it's Misha Tate's responsibility to tap, um, you know, or it's the referee's reason responsibility to jump in, but, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't think that's a good move either, because then there could always be the second guessing, and, and the girl who's getting submitted can say, oh, I was about to get out of it, so you don't want the ref to jump in, it's sort of the responsibility of the person in the hole to tap out. 
No, I definitely agree. I mean, obviously, it happened to Nog not too long ago with Frankie Mir, and you know, I mean, that was uh, that was a test of wills, and 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 pride came into play there. Obviously, Nogueira being the most decorated heavyweight in, in the world with all the submissions, and obviously, you know, he teaches a uh, high level Brazilian Jiu Jitsu school down in Brazil. Um, you know, you don't want to tap to a guy who's got you in a hole like that. But look what happened to Nog. I mean, you know, literally, Frank Mir ripped his arm off, and and you know now. I think that definitely puts Frank Mir at the highest level, and obviously, you know, I'm getting off, I know I'm getting off topic bringing that up, but obviously this this fight here showed that Rousey's got a killer instinct. She ain't backing down. If this girl gets hands, I don't see anybody fucking being able to stand up and take that belt away. Yeah, uh, speaking of off topic, there's an epic stare down going on between uh, Triple H and Shawn Michaels on Raw right now, so I was only uh, I only had one ear on the phone. I'm just trying to... <laughs> well, dude, by Shawn all Michaels. means. Why don't, play me. why, don't you, why don't you just go watch the wrestling? I'll uh, I'll well, try to pick up the slack. The thing about it is, uh, Triple H is trying to end the Taker streak of WrestleMania this year, and uh, yeah, Shawn I Michaels has got a couple things to say about it. And uh, you know, it's sort of uh, it's compelling. The Rock and Cena are, are going at it. Uh, right. Dominic from Eaton Town, I'm sure, is all pumped up about this stuff going on. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'll get back. Uh, I'll get back to the real sport. I'll take my eyes off this. You know, big news. Well, I can't blame you, dude. I can't blame Dominic either because obviously Shawn Michaels, even though Triple H has experience in WrestleMania against the Taker, I'm sure Shawn Michaels coming out, helping his friend out, giving some advice because, you know what, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think this is finally the year the streak ends. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, well, I, I haven't really been following it too hard, but they're sort of making uh, Triple H and Shawn Michaels seem to be arguing at this point, but I think it's going to be The Undertaker's last match at WrestleMania, and I think uh, he's probably going to go out with a loss because that's sort of the honorable thing to do <laughs> for the kid now. Absolutely. Obviously, it's getting heated, so I smell sweet chin music on the way. But, hey, who am I to say? You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah or if well, uh, Hornswoggle comes out, it might be some sweet chin music. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, shit. Because he's a midget little person. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, Jesus! You had to bring the midget word. And listen, I can I can deal with a lot of other things, all right. But let's leave the midgets alone. You may know they're not people. But uh, anyway, I guess we'll move on to the next fight on the card, which pitted KJ Noons versus Josh the Punk Thompson. Another one you picked correct. Um, I think that's because you just hate KJ Noons and his beautiful hair. Um, yeah, that's true. I I, I did go on a tangent about Noons' hair at one point <laughs> in, early on in the show. When we used to do the fifteen-minute show, and we were literally <laughs> was it that long ago? Yeah, well, that was we started the show last March. This is this is like a year that we've been doing it. Wow, Jesus! Yeah. Happy anniversary, feller. Yeah, what likewise. Um, a kick in the nuts. Ooh, I guess, yeah, obviously you break my day. ass every time. <laughs> I thought I, I was shocked. I, I wasn't on the the show with you guys last week, and I I wasn't even. In town, so I emailed you guys my picks, and you guys emailed me back your picks. And uh, I was shocked that you guys both took KJ News. In all honesty, I think that the fact that Josh Thompson has had some injuries over yeah. the last couple of years, people sort of forget how good he was and how good he is. He's, he, you know, at one point he was probably a top ten lightweight. Yeah. Inactivity, sort of. I'm not really sure you could say that about him now, but he did. Uh, I think it was 2008. You know, he put it on Bill Melendez. Melendez came back and beat him. So they're one and one. You know, he's fought over in Japan. He's, he's fought some big guys. K.J. Noons is a great boxer. He's game. He's tough. You saw that in the Diaz fight. You know, Diaz could not put that guy away. Noons, you know, a lot, a lot of people thought Noons, Noons won one or two of those rounds. But he's just not, you know, he's not well-rounded. And uh, he just, the Josh Thompson was able to exploit it. And uh, you know, Thompson was sort of disappointed with the performance. It was sort of a boring performance. He gassed out a little bit. But... He was able to impose his will. He was able to, to get news on the ground and hold him there and stay active enough to keep the fight on the ground. And uh, I'm, I'm sort of looking forward to that, that trilogy with uh, Gilbert Melendez because there's not a whole lot of other interesting fights for Melendez right now. And, uh, you know, Nunes is, a, is, a, is a, a good fighter, but they need to stop putting him in these fights with, with uh, these top-level guys because he's not a top-level guy. Right. Um, you know, let him fight. Let him fight Paul Daly. That's a fight everybody wants to see. You know, put him in fights like that or fights against sort of the mid-tier guys, because uh, you're, I think they're hurting his career putting him up in these marquee matchups because he doesn't he doesn't have the all-around game that's going to you know allow him to win those matchups. 
I definitely agree with you, dude. And you know, it's not that I forgot that you know that 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 the punk was was you know definitely uh, one of the top lightweights out there. But you pointed out the injuries, which is what I brought up last week, which was my reasoning for the fight. It's just that he hasn't been uh, consistently fighting. Um, even in his last fight, you know, he, he, he went in injured to that fight. He came out injured. I just thought, you know, all the, you know, you know, for ring rust kind of, you know, is what I was looking at because he hasn't really fought top level dudes, uh, in the last couple, uh, uh, of his fights, but the injuries I thought were adding up, and I thought might have been a detriment. And yeah, I, I agree with you. KJ isn't really top level because he doesn't have the stellar ground game to to when he goes up against a guy who has a really good ground game to keep it on the feet, which is where he needs the fight to be. He can't really be on the ground because uh, you know he, he can't transition into anything um, that's going to put him in an advantageous position down there unless he's fighting a guy on the same skill level as him. So you know even after the fight. Uh, you know, Thompson wasn't happy with his performance, but he did what he needed to do to win. And as long as he stays healthy, it's going to be a great fight against him and Gill. So I'm definitely pumped for that. At least, like you said, it's one more good fight for Gill because with the way Strike Force is going, it's uh, it's really dodgy when when you look at these cards sometimes to go. Am I even going to be entertained by this? Because it's really fucking getting really ridiculous sometimes. But you know, um, you know, good win for Thompson, and, and I think he's the better opponent to face Gill, so I was actually happier with that outcome. I was just pissed that it screwed me in the fantasy. Like, I seem all the time anymore. I just screw myself with the fantasy. So, moving on to another great pick of mine. But I think you picked him, too, and so did Dolo. was Paul Semtex Daly versus Kazuo Misaki. I thought this old bastard Misaki was just basically being thrown in there to get knocked out by Daly. And uh, not only did he not get knocked out by Daly, but he pretty much beat the balls off of Daly through those uh, three rounds. I, I, I really was impressed with his performance. I, I mean, he's not going to be going anywhere um, up the ranks, really, over there. Because, like I said, he's, what, 35, 36 years old. He's, got, he's had a lot of miles on him. and uh, you know, But I, I was pretty impressed with his overall game. What did you think of him? Yeah, I think that I think they did throw him in there to get knocked out by Paul Daly, the <laughs> name. And uh, you know, he fight he, he fought in Pride for years. Normally, 185, 183 pounder in Pride, so basically middleweight. Right. And he looked great right at 170. Didn't look like a 35 or 36 year old guy. I mean, uh, I think that you know the announcer said it five million times during the fight, but I think it was true that Paul Daly was not expecting that fighter to get into the cage that night. And right off the bat. When uh, Masaki was tagging him, I, I think Daly was never really able to get his rhythm. And Masaki wasn't respecting his hands. He wasn't respecting Paul Daly's hands. He was walking no. forward. He was landing his punches. And, you know, Daly, he wasn't allowing Daly to get off. Whereas, you know, mm. he wasn't. You see some, some guys, when they get in there with, a, you know, a knockout artist like a Paul Daly, where they're so tentative, they're just waiting to get hit, and they're waiting to react to that big punch and dodge that big punch, whereas Masaki. You know, he took sort of the alternate route and just went right at him. And, uh, you know, sort of like what Nick Diaz does, where you're, you're so overwhelmed by getting punched that you really can't punch back. If you're getting punched yeah. in the face, you can't punch. And uh, I think Daly probably underestimated him. And, uh, you know, the fact that he's acting at the end of the fight like he got robbed with the judge's decision. I mean, the fact that it was a split decision was a robbery for Misaki. He clearly won that yeah. fight 29-28 at least. I thought um, he won 30-27. Yeah, I, I, I could see either way, but at the very least, 29-28. And uh, the fact that one of the judges gave Paul Daly two rounds was sort of, you know, that was the robbery, in my opinion. But, you know, it's – Misaki, you, you never know with a guy like this. You get reinvented down to a different weight class. He's been in wars over in Japan. He, he beat Dan Henderson at one point. Um, but it was sort of an interesting storyline, and I was happy for him because, in all honesty, Paul Daly is not – He's really just not that likable of a guy, so I was happy to yeah. lose. Yeah, I, I was happy to see him lose, too. I, I picked him figuring, uh, like like we both just said, it, it seemed like a setup. They were just trying to get him a win under his belt, you know, to, to be the next guy to face off uh, for the title. Because I think, uh, you know, they just signed eight more court strike force. I think he's going to be fi fighting Tyron Woodley for the uh, vacant title. So I, I think they just wanted to get that win for Daly to be the next guy to face the winner of that fight. And now, all of a sudden, that's all muddled. Because uh, obviously, like you you pointed out, uh, Masaki didn't give two shits uh, about Daly's reputation for knockouts. He just waded in, and no. he definitely he outstruck the striker, and of course had the better ground game. I mean, when a striker is desperate going for takedowns, you know there's a problem. You know the guy's he's he's the plan B, and that plan B really doesn't usually work out for a guy who's a pure striker. So it was definitely a great win for Masaki, and. Uh, 
you know, I, like I said, I don't think he's going to make much noise. He's a little, uh, he's a little over over the hill. Uh, but like you said, who knows? Maybe since he's in a new weight class, it, it'll reinvent the guy, and uh, he might be able to put on a few interesting fights while he's over there. But um, overall, it was a pretty good story. Now this fight, you had right, and uh, you know, obviously, I don't know much about Lamumba Sayers. Uh, I, I know the guy was five and two going into the fight. I know Scott, you know Scott Smith that went down to one seventy. And was having trouble down there. I think he had lost three straight in a row. Of course, uh, Saturday pitted him against Lumumba Sayers and back up at 185. And uh, this did not go according to plan for me. Uh, can, tell me why you thought this kid Lumumba Sayers was going to do what he did to uh, to, to Scotty's uh, hands of steel or the comeback kid, which might as well throw that nickname out the window because it hasn't happened in forever. Uh, why did you pick Lumumba here? Well, I, I saw... I saw Sayers fight one time. Um, his last fight out of the first round knockout over um, Antoine Britt, or I forget who I forget who it was. Um, mm-hmm. But the thing about Scott Smith, he does have a couple. He's got basically he's got the Pete Cell comeback, he's got that Tung Lee comeback, and he's got the comeback against uh, Benji Raddick, I think it was. Um, yeah. In strike force as well. And, I believe you so. Know, like you said, he, he lost his, he lost his last three and four out of his last five. <clears throat> so. Let's, I like to crunch the numbers. So he's lost four out of five, <laughs> and three of his wins were all comeback wins that he was getting his ass beat in. That's handed. So if you really look at Scott Smith, his last ten fights, he's gotten his shit kicked out of him eight of those fights. So he was able to come back for three of them and land a lucky punch. So he's basically just a big, you know, he looks like Frankenstein in there. His fucking chin is straight up. He's got no right. technique. He literally goes in there and gets his shit kicked out of him. And he's got enough of a chin to sort of, you know, come to say, Lamar Sayers these. is the most cross eyed fucking dude on the face of the planet. I don't even understand how he can focus on the guy in front of him. I just, I, I, I was putting that against him, too. How do you see the guy you're fighting? Yeah, um, I, I don't know, but I mean, I, I really. <clears throat> Scott Smith is one of the worst fighters that uh, True. consistently gets put on main cards because of some of the things that he's done. And uh, he lost three. This was basically when. You know, win or you're out, basically, I think even the announcers were sort of alluding to that. And, uh, you know, Scott Smith was always a middleweight. He moved down to welterweight. He looked good at welterweight weight-wise and uh, was just, you know, they just put him they put him in against Paul Daly and guys that he should have been fighting at 170. And, uh, you know, back to 185, and he, he, he looked out of shape. He didn't look yeah. like he was like a solid middleweight like he used to look like. I think that. I think he came into this fight. I'm not sure how hard he trained. I'm not going to sit here and say he didn't train hard. I have no fucking idea. He didn't look like he trained that hard. He didn't look like, uh, you know, he sort of gave up pretty quickly when that submission was locked in. He looked like a guy who sort of knew his his fate was sealed. He knew that, um, you know, his time in the cage was sort of running out and was just going to collect one more paycheck. And, uh, you know, a guy, this kid Sayers looked like he was hungry and, and, you know, wants to move up the ladder. And, you know, I think that's probably the last time that we ever see Scott Smith. Uh, well, I hope so, and I, and I agree with you with a lot of things. Obviously, Scott Smith is not, you know, a marquee fighter. He's been in a lot of wars. You know, he's had some good things that went on in his career. But, dude, I just couldn't get over Lumumba Sayers' eyes. And <laughs> when he was going well, in, that, like Billy pointed out, that real angry Jesus rant about how fucking, oh, of course. you know, because Jesus, of course, gives him the power. To, I guess Jesus gave him sight beyond sight because there's no way that fucker should be able to see anything two feet in front of him, you know. All he should be looking at is his friggin' nose. I mean, it was ridiculous. I, I mean, I... I hate to keep bringing it up. I'm sure the guy could fucking punch my face in real easily, but he's going to have to try to catch me, and I think I'm going to be able to move around enough, as fat as I am, to really uh, uh, confuse him with those eyes. So, but Just great much, win. You, know, you can always measure somebody's intelligence by how many times they say Jesus in their post-fight uh, victory. <laughs> I'm, not I counted everybody that was, it, I'm not saying everybody that does that is stupid, but you, know, you look at a guy like him and Diego Sanchez, and these are just... <laughs> These are just imbeciles, and, uh, you know, regardless of all that. Speaking of, uh, you were just saying about to be able to dodge some of Sayers' um, punching. It leads me to a funny story. There's a uh, guy that me and Mike went to high school with. Okay. I'm not going to say his name, just because people might know him listening, but, you know, literally I'll say this guy's, uh, this guy's uh, the tail of the tape. I'd say about 5'8". I'd say, uh, you know, he ballooned up and down, but I'd say about 3'30", about 5'8", 3'30". <laughs> Wow, uh, Jesus! You know, people say you know this guy's built like a brick shit house. This guy was built like a snowman, perfectly round, <laughs> big fat round head, big fat round body, and big fat tree trunk legs. Mm. And we were uh, me and uh, and Chop Diesel and Matt Reck were down in uh, 
we were down visiting this person in uh, at a college where he lived, and we were all drunk and probably doing other things. And uh, we had no, about a half hour argument with this guy. He was telling us that he could take a punch from Mike Tyson in the face and not go down. Like, just stand there. <laughs> he could stand there with his hands on the side, let Mike Tyson punch him full force in the face, in the head, and he'd be able to stay on his feet. And uh, <laughs> this kid was arguing like, like, I was, like I was calling him a pussy, saying that he couldn't. Like, he was pissed off at me. That it, he said Mike Tyson or Lennox Lewis, either, either one of them. <laughs> this is when Lennox Lewis was the top guy in the world. Sure, and I said, yeah. Mike... Uh, I, I was like, dude, Lennox Lewis is six foot five, two sixty, and he punches people for a living. He's like, dude, I could take a punch, man. I'm telling you. Um, so this was, uh, it just sort of made me. When he talked about your fat ass dodging punches from uh, Boomba Sayers, it made me think about this fat frog to the snowman looking motherfucker taking a punch from Mike Tyson. <laughs> well, not for nothing. I've thrown down a similar claim, uh, but I threw Cyborg Santos's name in there. I don't know. I don't know if you've heard about that claim. <laughs> I think that was one of the. Uh, I think that was one of the weeks where I was on vacay. That was on my paid vacay that Weather Experts provides to me, and not you two. What? Uh, what was your claim? No, I said, uh, you know, if, uh, you know, because obviously we're going to be big radio stars. Eventually we're going to get these people in our our vast studios and stuff. And I said, obviously. you know, not for nothing, but. As great as Cyborg was, and this is, of course, before she was on the juice, so I don't know if this, this claim is still going to be out there when it happens, because you know it's going to happen. I said I could stand straight up and take a shot from Cyborg Santos and not get knocked out. I don't believe I said I'd still be standing, but I said I wouldn't get knocked out. And Dolo just fucking laughed at me, and then my own brother called in, and uh, he pulled the Judas on me and turned his back and said it's impossible. I don't believe well, so. Listen, that is not nearly as outlandish as the heavyweight champion of the world. Um, but <laughs> that's still comically outlandish, dude. Have you ever seen? Uh, I, I, I watch these YouTube clips of like one punch knockouts and girl knocks out guy. And right. If, if if dude, she is a Muay Thai kickboxer. She fights professionally for a living. If she I hits you on the karate. button, I mean, I literally, my karate. fiance could hit you on the button and knock you out. If you're standing there not defending yourself, if they get you in the right spot, you're done. I know. It's not a matter. Take it from a guy who's been knocked out a couple times in his life. It's not a matter of, of wanting to be knocked out. When you get knocked out, you're fucking out. I know, I know. I, 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 I've no been knocked out before. It? I, I understand. I just think I'm going to be able to do it. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's probably because I'm part chauvinist. That's like they always say about the, uh, you know, the young up-and-coming fighter that is undefeated and has never been knocked out in training or anything, that you're like, there's, you know, I've never been knocked out. I'm never going to get knocked out. And then you get knocked out, and you realize how easily you can get knocked out. Yeah, I, I know. I know that's all it takes. Obviously, if my head cranks the right way and all that, and she should be able to accomplish that. But especially now that she won't be juicing, I'm throwing it back on the table. No way, dude. No way. Not even. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even take a leg kick from that bitch. I, I wouldn't want a leg kick either. Obviously, the legs are a little bit bigger, a little bit stronger. But, you know, I'm just, I just want to throw it out there because it kind of related to your story. Obviously, I didn't go with that ridiculous, and I would never, ever want to be punched by Mike Tyson or Lennox Lewis. That I'll say right now. Right now. <laughs> but, That's uh, a bold statement. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we do on this show. If I were cauliflower for the years, we go out on limbs and we make outlandish statements like, I don't want to get punched by Mike Tyson. Right, yeah, exactly. So eat that up, people. And if you got a problem with it, why don't you call in three four seven three two six nine seven four one, and you tell me that you don't want to get knocked out by Mike Tyson, all right? But uh, anyway, I guess we'll finish this card up. We'll hit the break, and uh, you know we'll come back for the second hour. But uh, uh, Jacar, Jacare Souza versus Bristol Marunde. Uh I had J- Jacare winning by unanimous decision because, like Jake Shields, he's got pillow hands. I hate to take a shot at my boy Jake, but obviously it's, you know, we all know that's true. Um, but, of course, Jack Ray did what he do, and he got uh, Marunde uh, down in the third round and choked him out, which, of course, you know, that's mainly how Jack Ray takes care of guys. I just thought it was short notice. Marunde has a halfway decent record, depending on what website you go on. He's either 15 or 6 or 12 and 6. I'm not 100% sure. So somebody's beefing <laughs> up his record. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Bristol Marunde, last-minute replacement hasn't really, you know, fought top-level competition, so it kind of went the way it was expected. What did you think of this? Uh, how did you have it, Franco? I, I forget what you said, to be quite honest. Did you have him choking him out? Yeah, I had Jack Ray in the first round submission, and uh, yeah, of course. at one point it looked like it may happen. Uh, Jack Ray's really well-rounded. You know, he doesn't have any knockouts. I don't think it's necessarily because he has pillow hands. 
I wouldn't I wouldn't compare his hands to uh, to Jake Shields, but so he hasn't knocked out. anybody out. It looks like. His striking is strong, and he's throwing hard punches, but, you know, he just doesn't seem to finish guys. I also think sometimes he'll get, you know, he'll uh, do some damage on the feet and then just, you know, his instincts take over and he gets a submission. Um, who was he originally supposed to fight? Dr. I forget the guy's name, but he couldn't pass his medical. I, w- I wish I could remember, but I think it was going to be another, uh, it should have been another, I don't want to say easy win, because, like, I, yeah. I forget who he was supposed to fight, but I don't think it was really anybody who was going to, uh, really pose that much of a threat to Jackaray because obviously it's another thin division. They need somebody to fight Rockhold, so they're kind of gunning yeah, for Yeah, I mean, rematch. it's sort of a, you know, I, 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 he's one of my favorite fighters in Strike Force, Jackaray, so I would like to watch him fight, but wasn't a lot of suspense in this fight. I don't think many people really gave um, the other dude a chance. I don't even know his name off the top, man, so I'll just say the other dude. Marunde. Um, that's, that's, that's what we do over here at Roto X. His first name's Bristol, day. if you want to go with Bristol. Oh, really? Like uh, yeah. like Bristol Palin, the uh, yeah, Hold the human on. vacuum, the oral <laughs> vacuum, Bristol Palin. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so like you said, the middleweight division sort of hairy. Robbie Waller's still hanging around, but he can't beat anybody in the top ten. And uh, it looks like they're going to be having uh, Tim Kennedy and uh, Luke Rockhold finally. Kennedy. Up. <laughs> Kennedy. Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> So it sort of leaves Jacare. He's sort of a man without an opponent. I don't know what you know. Maybe I'd love to see him fight Musashi. I haven't seen Musashi fight in a while. I think Musashi's much better at 185. And there's been some rumblings that the UFC has signed him, but nothing's been confirmed either way. So you know, I think that's a fight I'd like to see Jacare um, in. But um, you know, some, uh, to something it looks like Jacare with his skill set. He should be, you know, top five in the world. And at one point I thought he was. And uh, he just doesn't seem, he hasn't seemed to really meet his full potential. I don't know if it's work ethic or if he just hasn't really been able to put it all together. But I, I always feel like he's just one little step away from being a legitimate, you know, top five pound for pound, uh, I'm sorry, top five middleweight in the world. Um, you know, I think we, you know, the Rockwell fight was close and Rockwell definitely won that fight. But I want to see Jacare fighting, you know, I want to see him fight Luke Rockhold. I want to see him fight Tim Kennedy. I want to see him fight Mutasi. I don't want to see him fight these no-name guys. It doesn't really get no. for his career. It doesn't really get me excited. No, it, it doesn't get me excited either. But like I said, I think they were just setting up for a win. But uh, before we uh, do go to break, because uh, I just want to point out that Bill Brown one pointed out that Zach Galifianakis took a shot from Mike Tyson in the hangover. So I don't know. Maybe I would take a shot from <laughs> For Mike Tyson. Another, you, know, that's that's an, you have like a, there's like a, a family of celebrities that you look like, and that's another one, Zach Galifianakis. You don't look just like them, but there's similarities. You have like, you have that like familiar face where a lot of people look like you. So I'm going to put that down in my diary and uh, add one, one more to the, uh, the butcher lookalike. Oh, all right then. Well, after that said, uh, I guess uh, I just got to ask you this. Say, uh, do, you, do you like blogs? Uh, I do. I love them. You do. Um, you know, I, I know you like to write blogs sometimes. And uh, could you recommend a, a website that uh, that we uh, could uh, all go take a look at? Maybe one of your articles. Uh, well, there are some of my ar- articles archived on this particular website, but I haven't written one in about six weeks, so uh, you Perfect. have to go to the archive section. And I think the name of that website is um, um, I forget what's the name of that website. Tom? I believe it's called the Esquad.com. I'm not after it, so that's why I've got to the time. And Esquad.com. A new era has dawned in blogging. Log on to the Xlog.com and experience new standards and quality in commentary and analysis. Powered by RotoExperts.com, the Xlog.com brings together the top expert bloggers with all the very best the Xlog has to offer. You don't have to search for the most compelling and entertaining posts and writers anymore. They will be at your one central hub for high quality. So join us as a new revolution begins in sports and entertainment only at the xlog.com. That's T H E X L O G dot com. <laughs> Ha! 
I'm at the Pizza Hut. What? I'm at the Taco Bell. What? I'm at the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. I'm at the Pizza Hut. What? I'm at the Taco Bell. Nah. I'm at the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. Wait, we're at the Pizza Hut. What? We're at the Taco Bell. What? We're at the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. We at the Pizza Hut. No. We at the Taco Bell. No. We at the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. Cauliflower for the years. Remember, I call the number three four seven. <coughs> Let me clear my throat. Three four seven three two six nine seven four one three four seven three two six nine seven four one. Obviously, we were uh, finishing up with the strike force card before we get into the UFC card, uh, Franco. Uh, I just wanted to ask you something. You see that Josh Barnett uh, got reinstated in California. His license back on 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 tap. Uh, you know, I saw like a, a headline about it. I didn't actually read the story so that they're they're shooting for that card uh, in California. So he got uh, reinstated there. Yeah, he got reinstated. Of course, uh, uh, here's the fucked up thing with the commission because I know they've had a hard on for him, but with good reason. Because you know he's been a little dishonest in the past, and uh, obviously has had uh, a lot of accusations. Had been caught a couple times with steroids, but uh, the commission was quoted as saying California needs good fighters. That's why they reinstated him. So no, that's, that's good reason. <laughs> you know, that's a good reason, but yet poor Nick Diaz is suspended with a little bit of uh, pot Aww, use, even though he got poor Nick Diaz. Oh, jeez. I knew I should have left his name out of this. But uh, <laughs> the, the war master, since he dropped the baby face assassin nickname, because he's getting a little older now, um, he has to co- uh, consent to random biological fluid testing, which really gets my appetite uh, worked up when I hear stuff like that. <laughs> Is it random you know. or random fluids that they're going to be testing? That's what mm. I want to know. I'm salivating after saying those words because it just really brings a lot of things to my head. So, you know. Well, speaking um, of uh, speaking of bodily functions, uh, every Monday as we're sort of preparing for the show, I watch Inside the MM, Inside MMA on uh, HCNet. It's uh, Boss Rudin and uh, you, ever, you ever watch that that show? It's like they have a panel every week and they do results and everything. Uh, I'm going to be honest, I really don't turn on my TV unless there's like a fight card on or something like that, so I, I always forget to, to check out uh, Bass Rutten, even though I find him hysterical. Yeah, well anyway, so it's sort of beside the point, it's a good show, it's on HCNet, which is like uh, Mark Cuban's uh, cable station network, and I'm watching it tonight, and I'm not sure if I brought this up on the show a few weeks ago, so if I did, just uh, kick me in the nuts next time you see me, but... <laughs> um, down in uh, down in Long Branch, there's that uh, bikini barbers. Do you ever hear of that with the girls? They cut your hair in a bikini. I'm actually friends with them on Facebook. I couldn't believe it that they wanted to be my friend, and I said yes, I'll be your friend. And uh, then I just uh, reaped all over their pictures. Beautiful. Um, so they have a reality show on this channel now. Um, I think it's already airing, um, and yeah. it's literally like right up the road. And it's all these whores that cut your hair in a bikini, <sighs> and this uh, this Guido with, uh, you know, uh, affliction, uh, long sleeves and greased back hair, uh, talking to them like they're pieces of trash. So it's very entertaining, and I have just set my DVR to record the next three episodes. <laughs> At least that guy's not a walking back stereotype. Oh, uh, it's, <laughs> well, it's the trashiest thing you've ever seen. I need a haircut, so maybe I'll go take a ride down there. I'll, I'll check it out. I'll let you know how, how good the haircuts are. I won't be yeah, going I'm... there for anything else. No, you won't be going there for a bag of blow or a sixty dollar blow job. No. Not at all. Oh Jesus. If they got blow there, forget about it. I'll be in the back <laughs> trying to fucking work them for handies, you know. They'll have to throw my ass <laughs> if out. If they of got there. blow there, you're gonna be uh, sweeping up hair for the next ninety years working up your debt. Yeah, they they won't be able to get rid of me, dude. You know, so hopefully that isn't like a cover and they had all this other shit going on because it could be a home home away from home or maybe just home from here on out. I don't even know. Yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of time until they get arrested for uh, drug trafficking, uh, bookkeeping, or prostitution. I mean, there's no way that that guy's just having those girls cut hair. Well, you know, now you've really got my, my interest peaked, so I'll be heading down there uh, probably tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, maybe Wednesday before the show. That way i got a great story if I'm not locked up when I go down there. So, 
<laughs> One other thing I wanted to bring up before we hit on the card. I know we're uh, we're running low on time. Do you see that uh, Roy Nelson claims he will drop to light heavyweight if he gets 100,000 likes on Facebook? Yeah, I did. That's funny. We uh, you know we both write you know a couple of news stories in case we're running low on time, and that was the one that uh, I chose one of those too. And when I saw it, I think I saw it when he sort of first did it. He was at like 39,000 likes or something. Nice. Uh, I'm not sure where he's at now, but uh, I don't know. That's it's, it's. I don't know if he's going to get there. I mean, he needs. You know, he needs to. You know, 200 percent of what he already has. So um, <laughs> I think he needs to fight at 205. I mean, is he going to be able? Is he going to be able to sell another Roy Nelson heavyweight fight? He, he's fun to watch no. and everything, but he needs to sort of reinvent himself. And uh, you know, I think no matter what, he needs to cut to 205. Absolutely. He's only got uh, what 60 pounds. Actually, he came in at 246 last time. So, actually, it's only 41 pounds he's got to get rid of. I think he can do it. Yeah, well, as uh, as Joe the um, uh, as, as Joe the uh, as Joe Rogan would say, the, uh, the exa- Joe the Exaggerator Rogan. Uh, <laughs> Murphy, he's got the, I think he's got the frame of a flyweight at this point, and he's, uh, he's fighting 120 pounds above his natural weight, just like uh, just like Ray Maynard walks around at 240 between fights. Well, he does. That's it's an obvious thing. Um, yeah. You know, I've seen Gray Maynard, and he is fucking big when he is, uh, uh, you know, walking around. But uh, just to I let love you know, Rogan, but he gets a little, uh, he gets a little overzealous on on certain points, like talking about how Fedor is a, a middleweight as well. I mean, that's just stupid. <laughs> one thing I wanted to mention, uh, one thing I wanted to mention quickly, when I was in the uh, Dominican Republic, I was out for a work function, and I got back, and <clears throat> I'm flipping through the channels, and uh, I see Fox Sports New York, and it was the night, I'm sorry, not for, Fox Sports New York, Fox Sports fucking Deportes or whatever uh, chicken scratch language they speak down there. Um, yeah, something like and that. And it was uh, Fox Sports, and UFC 144 was on. I got to watch it for free because what? it was just on regular cable, so I didn't have to pay for it, so I was able to watch that event, and it was in Spanish, so uh, my fiance was sleeping next to me, so I just sort of turned the volume down, and it was so nice to watch an event live without the commentating because I was able really? to just draw my own conclusions and enjoy the fights. And I was able to watch that. The Frank Edgar um, fight was a close fight. And as I'm watching the fight, I'm sitting there wondering, like, whose nuts are they sucking? Because I know that they're ben. taking one side or the other. And Dolan told me later that it was Henderson. But yeah. it's, it's so great to watch those close fights and be able to make my own judgments and score the fights on the merits of the actual fighters as opposed to what the announcers were saying about them, it was awesome. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm sure it was because we were going crazy because, you know, I definitely scored that fight for Frankie, but yet if hearing Rogan tell it, Benson Henderson just fucking destroyed Frankie. Every shot that Benson landed was just so damaging that Frankie should be dead. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm not even I'm not even exaggerating. And Goldie's trying to get a word in edgewise by going, you know, I mean, Frankie's landing a lot of strikes here and he's had a bunch of takedowns. And Joe's just going, <laughs> right over Goldberg. Like, Goldberg's a fucking idiot. <laughs> yeah, and let me ask you this. I, I literally didn't see, didn't hear the commentary, didn't read anything. I'm sure, did Rogan say that uh, Frank Edgar should drop to 145? Did he say it five times during the fight or no? Oh, of course. You know, he said yeah. all these guys that he's fighting at lightweight are just monsters compared to him. He just has the frame of a lightweight, maybe even a bantamweight, but he could definitely compete at a high level mm. at the 145-pound division. And, if, you know, I might have put my foot through the TV if I didn't see, like, uh, Kevin Dolan, like, every once in a while since he lives so far away. I didn't want to break his TV on him, you know? Yeah. But it's like him and Dana White. You know, he could really be a force at 145, yada, yada, yada. Dana White always says it. Listen, he's a fucking force at 155. Let the guy fight yeah. where he wants to fight. He's obviously pretty good at 155. You know, give him one more shot at the title. Absolutely. If, if um, he loses, if Henderson, it, yeah. if he loses Henderson. then he goes down to 145 and gets a title shot or one fight and a title shot. Benson Anderson was on the MMA hour today. He said, you know, uh, Frank Yeager deserves a rematch. I know what he's saying because he's given all these other guys rematches. The fight was close. And Henderson yeah, was like, listen, I'll, I'll fight him tomorrow. He deserves the rematch. Uh, good. See, that, see that's, that's just it, dude. You know, I, I might get cut off here for a second, but I got the other uh, uh, line set up for myself. But uh, that, I respect that. That's why I really didn't walk away and really fucking was, like, really bitter and bullshit over it because at least Benson wasn't like, yeah, I totally dominated him and all that kind of shit. Like, that's what kind of put a bad, real bad taste in my mouth with the Co- Carlos Conant Nick Diaz thing and even this last Friday's fight with Demetrius Johnson where Johnson was just like, yeah, oh, cheering after the fight saying he did everything he needed to do to win the fight. And I was like, you fucking midget. No, you didn't, dude. 
you know, and, and, and uh-huh. like, I'm not expecting a fighter to sit back and go, yeah, I lost that fight, because I know they, they really can't say that, they got to promote themselves, but let's not make it seem like you dominated the dude and, and, and got that, that win easily, you know what I'm saying, and, and, and at least Benson was like, yeah, it's a close fight, he deserves a rematch, you know, he never once said he dominated Frankie even after the fight and stuff, so it was, it was I couldn't really be pissed, and I'm glad he didn't do that, because I didn't want to start hating another fighter that I really like, you know. <laughs> You have enough hate in your heart, Dubs. You don't need any more hate in your heart. Absolutely. And I know we're running low on time, but I'm, I want to fit this in now because I'm sure we're going to get cut off later. Uh, you see that uh, Rampage Jackson is fucking around with the testosterone? Yeah, I saw that he, uh, uh, you know, low testosterone levels. I mean, it's just as far as it's like the medical um, marijuana cards in, in California. It's the same shit. Like, they're going to get tested. Like, I mean, a lot of times the reason – I'm not saying Rampage in general because I don't think he's a steroid user, but a lot of times these guys – their testosterone levels are low because of prior steroid use. Because when you right. steroid, it, it spikes the level of the testosterone in your body, and you're getting it artificially, so your body stops producing it naturally. So once you get off the steroids, your body is not producing the testosterone that it used to produce, so you have a low testosterone level. So it's like these guys are being rewarded for past steroid use by getting testosterone replacement therapy. It's just a big fucking farce, in my opinion. I, I agree with you, and you know, I mean, obviously Rampage has never missed weight before, obviously he kind of blamed this for retaining water and missing weight, but uh, you know, we all got to remember this too, and I don't want to accuse Rampage of it, he was obviously never caught using steroids or anything, but we all know most of his career was fought in a place that they don't give a shit, as long as, you know, there's, they get a great product in the ring and people are going, you know, crazy in the stands and loving the fighters, they really don't – they look the other way when it comes to testing. You know, again, we, we talked about Bornett earlier. I mean, he fought pretty much his whole career in Japan after, uh, you know, he tested positive for, when he took the heavyweight title from uh, Randy Couture back in the day. And they really don't test over there. You know, it's very rare that anybody comes up on a test. So, you know, I don't want to accuse Rampage, but, uh, you know, there has been a lot of evidence of that. Like you said, it's dudes who have been screwing around in the past – with uh, steroids that all of a sudden their testosterone levels start to drop. So, you know, uh, it's tough to say, but, you know, Rampage, the way he was talking about in the interview was, you know, he definitely didn't um, put it in a way where it seemed like, hey, it's not a performance-enhancing drug. He was just like, yeah, it was amazing. I felt so much younger, so much stronger. I was banging broad. Sorry about that. I got cut off. Uh, no problem. Um... But I was banging, you know, I was banging five times a night now and shit. He was saying stuff like that in the interview. So, I mean, you know, for the guy to sit there and be like, it's not a performance-enhancing thing because it's naturally what your body produces, he really went about it wrong in the interview. So it kind of made it seem like, yeah, dude, I'm ready to rock because I can, uh, you know, trick my body into, you know, producing this, this testosterone unnaturally. And he said he put on a lot of muscle and everything, when, when, even in the short a lot time. Of muscle, yeah. Yeah. Looks like he, he, said, he didn't look like too much muscle in that fight. He looked fucking fat. Well, that's because of all the water he retained. He said that was the, that was the bad part. Uh, please. It's because he thought he was going to be able to stroll in there and knock Ryan Bader out, or he just, you know, he was I, he, he was pulling a little bit of a Brock Lesnar there. I think he just showed up to collect a paycheck. Whether he either he either underestimated Bader or he just didn't give a shit, but he wasn't there to fight. It was pretty obvious. And uh, you yeah. know, Bader 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 out muscled on me. I worked him, and you know, Rampage literally was looking for one big punch. He gasped almost immediately. And he literally, he looked, you know, 20 pounds fatter than I've ever seen him look. It was like, as soon as, as, soon as they walked out, I was like, Rampage just got no shot because he didn't train for this fight. Yeah, exactly. No, I agree with you. At the way, he looked fine because he still had all that water weight off. But as soon as, you know, yeah. he rehydrated and stuff, he had a belly. And uh, he yeah, really I mean, didn't he, had, he was jiggling. He, they were in the clinch and he was jiggling around. I mean, listen, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not a fitness model by any means, but I'm not a professional fighter either. You know, he, he, no, exactly. he looked he looked kind of like your every man sort of a little bit of a belly and it just uh, it didn't look I mean that fight against John Jones I really think that he put everything into that fight he looked like he was in amazing shape he didn't gas he had a decent game plan he was just sort of outmatched by John Jones that fight you know he lost that fight and I think uh, you know I, I'm I think we're going to see him fight one more time maybe against Shogun and I think Shogun's going to finish him and I think Randy will probably retire I don't think it's hard to do anymore. I definitely agree with that. I hope they, uh, they they fight in Brazil at some place that they should put Rampage. You know, obviously, everybody, they know the history between those two guys back in Pride. And, uh, you know, uh, I think you're right. Shogun's going to finish him, and that's probably going to be the last one. But, uh, you know, I guess we'll get off that. But uh, moving on to the to the next thing was the UFC on FX2 card, which, you know, had definitely uh, 
I thought it was a pretty solid card. It was, it was pretty impressive. It definitely had its share of controversy in one fight. But overall, very impressive. The main event pitted Diego Pitbull Owls versus Martin the Hitman Campman, who I have dogged in the past. Not his killer instinct. But uh, he definitely impressed me here with pulling out this victory. What would you think of it, Franco? Yeah, both guys were sort of in similar positions. Both guys that have been at the top of the division, uh, you know, within the last few years. And, um, you know, Alves had the recent loss to Rick Story, and Canvas had a couple tough losses. So it was sort of, this fight was sort of the winner of this fight was going to stay relevant, and the loser of this fight was going to, you know, get relegated down to that mid tier welterweight. And uh, Alves looked good for the first two rounds. He, you know, the, the big knock on Canvas has always been that um, he's too complacent, that. You know, if it's, um, you know, he feels like he's ahead on points when he's not doing enough or, um, you know, he just isn't aggressive enough. And I think we were seeing that in this fight. I think he was actually, I think Alves was, was, was mixing it up well. And, uh, you know, I don't think it was by lack of effort that Cameron was losing the fight, but Alves was just getting the better of him against that third round. And, uh, you know, Alves uh, hits him with a good shot and looks to, to finish Campman, or he thinks he has Campman uh, hurt, so he goes in for the kill and uh, just winds up in a bad position, and Campman is able to lock that choke and just sort of bad, sloppy defense by Alves. I think probably just a little bit tired and a little bit overzealous trying to get that finish. This is a fight where I don't think either guy really came out looking great just because Alves dominated the fight and lost, and Campman didn't really look that great, and he won, so I don't think it, it did a lot. For, for either guy, but, you know, obviously you'd rather be the winner than the loser, so this will keep Campman relevant, but you know, he's a guy that I've always rooted for, and uh, the more I see him fight, the less I'm, I tend to be rooting for him. I think yeah. he's, got, he's got potential, and I just don't know if he's ever going to turn that corner. I, every fight, I hope that he does, um, but, you know, it's a win. I'm sure he's happy with the win, the, the main event on, uh, on, on cable television. He beats the guy that used to that, that, that challenge for the title, so you know, overall, I'm sure he's just happy to get the win. Uh, he, he's definitely excited for it, but I, I gotta I gotta agree with you with, with a bunch of stuff you said. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of either of these guys, but you know, it certainly had a potential <clears throat> to to be a good matchup, and uh, it did turn out to be pretty good. I mean, obviously, Tiago was beating Martin to the to the punch, which I was surprised at. I thought Cam should have had more of an advantage on the feet. I know tiago has got a shit ton of knockouts. I think he's credited with the most knockouts in the UFC, if I'm correct, um, which just means, it, you know, he's real heavy-handed. He does have pretty good boxing, but I, I really thought Campman had the advantage on the feet. I thought Alves was going to have to get it on the ground to really kind of kind of work for, for a decision victory, and uh, I was pretty shocked by that, seeing that Alves came out strong, was beating Campman to the punch just about every time uh, out there, and, uh, you know, it had a great dramatic finish, but I, I can't help but agree with you there. I mean, yeah, it's better for Campman that he got the win. It keeps him, you know, kind of puts him towards the top of the division again because, you know, he was, com- he was coming off of, uh, well, he beat Story, but, uh, you know, before that he had the two losses in a row. Um, you know, and, and Alves, you know, he's up and down all the time too, so it's not exactly like a marquee fight to really push you to the top. It's just that these guys are always in the mix. So the one guy holds a spot, the other guy now has to, you know, get back to work and, uh, you know, Alves has had issues uh, being at 170 since he's a big dude and cutting weight, but I know he's got Mike Dolce in his camp, so maybe, you know, uh, you know he's just got to learn how to, you know, work with that diet and everything. But he looked good. He looked fresh. He didn't look like he gassed at all. It's just that I think he got too aggressive. He should have kept it on the feet because he definitely had Campman hurt, but he was going to take it to the ground and, 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 and pound him out. And uh, sure. unfortunately, Campman got that choke in, and he just fucking torqued it and wasn't letting it go. He knew this was his opportunity, which is what he said after the fight, and he knew he had to make it count, and he did. You know, he, he choked him out, and, and I mean, Alvis tapped pretty quick. And I don't think it was just a quick tap like, I'm, I'm nervous, I'm in a hole. That thing looked pretty vicious when he had it in. Yeah, and you mentioned uh, Tiago Alves now with the Dolce diet. Like you said, he had some issues getting to 170 previously, and uh, I'm not sure if you saw this or if you read this, but he weighed in. I think he was, uh, you know, he weighed in 170 and a half or whatever he weighed in at. And let's say the weigh-in was at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a picture on Twitter that Mike Dolce and Tiago Alves took at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It was like three or four hours after the weigh-in. He was up to 197 and a half. He had put on 27 and a half pounds in like three and a half hours. Um, wow. So I guess, you know, I think that Dolce was sort of, you know, tooting his own horn. But, you know, yeah. at the same point, I mean, is that the best for your fighter to, to, to 
to be so dehydrated that you can literally put on 30 pounds in three hours? I mean, is that – is he at his optimal – uh, you know, is, is he at optical form in, in the octagon at that point, having to rehydrate that amount of fluid? You know, I don't Probably know. Not. I mean, that's, that's what you would though. figure. I mean, and to sort of, that was always his problem, and it was, okay, we're going to cut out the weight training, we're going to get him leaner and make the weight cut easier so, you know, it's not so hard on his body. And then, you know, you got him, like, literally, he's rehydrating 30 pounds in three hours. It can't be the best, it can't, it can't be the best, uh, you know, it can't be the best for his body, you know, regardless for, for his liver, if nothing else. It's not for just his performance in the cage, for his liver, for his heart, for his kidneys, to have to get that dehydrated and, and work that hard to keep his body functioning. I mean, it's got to be terrible for him. <laughs> it probably is, dude, but... Hey, probably, I mean, hey, really. As long as he's putting on interesting fights, that's the important thing, right? That's true. <laughs> totally true. Who cares about itself? But... You know, not not for nothing. Uh, Dolce does do that a lot because if you remember when Rumble Johnson uh, uh, came in overweight against Vidor, uh, Dolce is also he works with uh, Vidor as well. Vidor rehydrated and and put on like 20 pounds or, or 25 pounds or something like that uh, going into that fight. So obviously Johnson, you know, came in grossly overweight, and uh, by fight time, Vidor might have actually outweighed Johnson or was close to the same weight. You know what I'm saying? No, so, no, no. Uh, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to argue with you. Uh, but they basically they had the weigh-ins, and Johnson was way overweight. And Vitor said, the only way I'll fight him is that 24 hours from now, he can't be above 205. Or, 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 right, yeah. Right? So they weighed yep. in. Vitor was only 197 when they reweighed in 24 hours later, and Johnson was whatever he was, 203 or 204. So oh, was he only 197? I thought yeah, he was more than because the, the only reason I know that is because yeah. everybody, once this Alves picture hit, he was heavier than right. Vidor was. The 20, so, in other words, three hours after the weigh-in, he was heavier than Vidor was 24 hours after the weigh-in. Oh, wow. You know, say, yeah, I, 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 I got that mixed up then. Yeah, no, that's, that's cool. That was actually, I'm glad that you brought that up because that was the point was it had, you know, Vidor was a decent, you know, used to be a light heavyweight and a heavyweight, and at this point it's like a, probably an average-sized middleweight, but Alves was, well, you know, Alves cut more weight getting the 170 than Vidor did getting the 185. <laughs> Well, that's fucking Great. ridiculous. I, 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 get, I guess I had the facts wrong, but now that you straighten it out, yeah, that is fucking crazy that, that, that Diego Alves is, is weighing more than Vitor Belfort walking into the octagon. That's insane. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's too much of a weight cut, and Alves is, uh, you know, he had that sort of out of nowhere knock out of Matt Hughes when Matt Hughes was still, you know, considered one of the top welterweights in the world. But, you know, you go after, after that, I mean, he, he fought John Fitch twice. I think Fitch beat him twice, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yes. Got the Rick Story beat him. You know, Alves doesn't have a I lot of him. wins over. Uh, who did? I did. Oh, you in, did in nice. uh, UFC Undisputed three. I beat him. Actually, he used to be my, the the first UFC Undisputed. I was always uh, I was Alves because he had that beetle uh, high kick, and I would set uh, I'd be setting Dolan up all day. I would just be leg kick, move back, leg kick, leg kick, <laughs> leg kick, bam, high kick, knockout, lights are out. That's uh, awesome. That's awesome. But, you know, Alves has never really beat. I, I don't know if he's ever beat a top ten guy. And, uh, you know, I don't really know where he goes from here. That's a tough loss to take. Yeah, definitely a tough loss, especially after dominating like that. But, uh, you know, I mean, great for Campman, but really what do you do with these two guys? But moving on, uh, with the second uh, fight of the flyweight tournament that started on, on Friday night, um, I felt it was a pretty uh, impressive performance for Joe B. Juan Kenobi, uh, Joseph Benita, Benavidez. Um, I think we all kind of knew that Yasuhiro Yurishitani was just they, – they picked the name out of a hat. You know, obviously he's he's been fighting at, at, in the lower weight classes. You know, the guy's got 19 wins. You know, but pretty uh, – uh, you know, pretty unimpressed. He's got six draws on his record. So I really didn't see him being able to stand up to a a, a guy of Benavidez's uh, track record. You know, I picked Benavidez by round two sub. Of course, he came out and knocked uh, Yurishitani out in the second round. Uh, pretty impressive performance. What I wasn't impressed with was all of a sudden they decided to do rankings in the flyweight division uh, today, and they put Benavidez at the top when uh, the guy we're going to talk about in the next fight has been the consensus number one flyweight in the world uh, leading up until this point. But uh, I would, you know, before we get into that, what did you think of the fight, dude? Uh, I, I mean, this was really impressive, like you said. I didn't know a whole lot about the other dude. He was fighting uh, mostly in Japan. And I think like most American fans, um, 
I don't know a lot of Japanese fighters, number one, because the names confuse me. So the, the, well, the names I, are all... Yeah, they all sound the same. They, they all, all sound, sound the same. same. Before you go on, can I, can I give you another bit of information? Out of his 19 sure. wins, 14 of those went to the cards, and he's got six mm. draws on his record. All right, now, like now I'm sorry I interrupted you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, exactly. I'm just going to be honest. A lot of the names are very similar, and they look the same. Uh, so a lot of times I don't know who's who unless I see him fight more than a bunch of times, and that's just the truth. I'm just being honest. Um, yeah, sure. So, I did, you know, I bet I put Captain Oriomi in there. I had no idea. <laughs> so I looked, uh, you know, obviously I thought it was a pretty – I think that was the easiest part of the night to pick. The funny – the thing that I'll say about um, – you just mentioned the rankings and the re-ranked, uh, you know, the, the flyweights. You know, they at one point I think they said, you know, Demetrius Johnson's probably the number two flyweight in the world and they were ranking Benavidez. Um, like most of these guys were all coming down from one thirty five. They didn't even have a fight at one twenty five. So right. I, you know, how do they got Demetrius Johnson ranked number two in the world before you know, now at this point now they've all got a fight at one twenty five, now you can get the rankings out, but it's just that sort of that you have that UFC marketing machine where you're watching Ian McCall fight Demetrius Johnson, and they're telling you that they're probably the two best flyweights in the world, and Demetrius Johnson doesn't have any fights to flyweight, so, you know, right. they, they could almost tell you whatever they want to tell you during the fight to hype the fight, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's just misinformation. I mean, the guy was fighting in the WEC and the UFC at 135, and he was probably a top five, uh, you know, uh, bantamweight, but to just, you know, just because he dropped weight, he was good at 135, doesn't, you know, you have to get at least one fight in the division in the last couple of years to be ranked, so I, that just kind of you that they did that. Yeah, it's insane. You know, they're you almost know, saying I, all these guys over in Japan, which is where a lot of the, the lighter weight classes, um, you know, the best fighters in the world, or at least up to this point where the best 125 pounders were fighting, it's almost like saying none of those fights count. Those guys that have been fighting at 125 for the last 10 exactly. years don't even count. This guy, this guy fights for our organization, and this is his first fight in this division, but he's number two in the world. Let him let him get the fight under his belt before you start ranking them. No, I, I definitely agree. And you know, Billy had to throw out a shot saying that Ian McCall was a top five smack user too. And I just want to let him know it doesn't make him a bad person because somebody on this radio show used to do that as well. I'm not going to name names, but it's one of the two guys talking right now. But hey, whatever. All right, I don't want to <laughs> throw shots and jabs at anybody. Okay, might have been me. I'm not saying nothing. But uh, yeah, you know, I mean. <laughs> Like, how do you throw these other guys' records out there? Even the guy that we were just – that better be this point, you're Shitani. He was probably the number two or three flyweight. So, I mean, okay, so Joseph Benavides definitely leapfrogged him because he knocked his ass out. But, meh, he wasn't really, you know, if you look at his track record, a, a really exciting fighter, not a real dominant fighter, but he found a way to win or tie most of the time out. And, uh, <laughs> you know <laughs> – <laughs> and, and, and I know he did hold the title or two in the flyweight division. So, yeah, I mean, to go into these fights on Friday and try to sell us on the fact, now we can't discredit Demetrius Johnson or, or Joseph Benavides because, yeah, they've been definite forces at 135, and definitely Demetrius Johnson's fighting out of weight. Benavides is, a, you know, he's, he's cutting some weight to come down to 125, but to try to tell us that these dudes deserve a ranking over these other guys, it's a little unfair because they have been working at it for a while. But, yeah, uh, uh, Beefcake, Joe uh, Benavides, I'm not decided on which one of his nicknames I like more. That's why I just That's throw them out there. Yeah. Do you ever think, uh, think Beefcake's better? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, I love Beefcake, and what I was thinking <laughs> as I was watching these fights that, um, you know, if you if you were to tell me that a uh, 125 pound man could just beat the living shit out of me, I'd probably tell you that you were crazy. But I mean, it's, it's completely true. I mean, one of those guys could probably beat us up at the same time. Um, yeah, yeah. And like, like, like the, 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 they're like little guys. They're like five four, one twenty five. If you ever saw that guy like on the street, you just you know, you have no idea how dangerous of a human being he was. <laughs> exactly, dude. they're so quick and they're just throwing kicks and shit and they just don't <laughs> slow down so you know they could definitely put a major major hurting on you I'm, I don't want to meet the beefcake in a dark alley you know let, uh -oh. him, let him get his wins and well alright maybe I do you might be on to something <laughs> but you know <laughs> very impressive performance for him and he definitely deserves his spot in the title match now moving on to the first flyweight fight ever in the UFC um, I was pretty disgusted with the outcome of this fight. I know we talked earlier, and you, and you said it was a little bit close. You felt it was a little bit closer than I, I did, but I absolutely thought it was ridiculous that at the end of this fight between Demetrius Johnson and Ian Uncle, 
creepy. McCall, um, they raised Demetrius Johnson's hand and said that he was victorious because I didn't see at any point in that fight uh, Johnson in control. Uh, I felt McCall controlled pretty much the whole fight. I definitely gave him two rounds uh, uh, to one in, in favor of Ian McCall, and I think it should have just been decided McCall should be fighting for the title right now. And then, of course, controversy pops up at the fucking uh, uh, post-fight press conference, and the athletic uh, commissioner in, in Australia comes in and says that he made a mistake when the judges handed him the cards. He read one of the judges' scorecards wrong. It's supposed to be a majority draw. And uh, he read it as giving it to, to Johnson two, round, uh, uh, two judges to one. And so now all of a sudden these guys got to fight again next month. Now, I mean, I would like you to expound on what you were saying before because we didn't want to get into details because we knew we were going to be talking about it tonight. Um, you, you felt it was a little bit closer, so you weren't that overly shocked by it. But overall, how would you feel about this fight, dude? Yeah, I, I think I would have given it to McCall two rounds to one, but I wasn't really uh, – yeah, I didn't think it was a terrible decision. I thought that the first two rounds were uh, close enough to go either way. I, w- I would have scored probably – Third round was definitely McCall, um, and, and you know it's just it's one of those fights where you know Johnson's he's similar to like a Frank Edgar he uses movement doesn't you know have a, doesn't do a lot of damage with his strikes but they're effective and uh, you know it, th- those are hard fights to score and I think a lot of times that when a guy like McCall finishes the fight so strong in the third round he gets a dominant position. He's playing up to the crowd, and, and he really gets the crowd behind him. And, you know, the thing about it that people don't understand, okay, that's a 10-9 round, okay? He dominated them, but it wasn't 10-8. It was 10-9. But yeah, there I can agree. also be a really boring round where one guy just has a slight edge, and that's also a 10-9 round. So if, you're, if right. you're scoring the fight as a whole, you might say, oh, shit, McCall was beating his ass. But, you know, that, third 10, that 10-9 round scores the same as a close 10-9 round. So... You know, I don't think it was a robbery. Uh, I feel much better now that it was scored a draw because I think that's uh, a lot more realistic than actually giving the decision to Johnson. So, you know, I thought I thought the, I thought McCall won the fight, but uh, I wasn't up in arms when they gave the decision to Johnson. I was a little disappointed. Um, so you said they're they're fighting next month. Next what month. Call they play, um, I forget. Um, on a pay per view or on like regular TV. I think it's going to be the regular TV one. Uh, it might be on the Fuel one on the 14th, if I'm, if I'm correct, which, of course, I don't get Fuel because Comcast sucks, so I won't be able to see it. But, yeah, that uh, sucks, dude. Fuel's, Fuel's they're just they're, they're knocking out UFC programming. Every night there's UFC shit on that dude, channel. It's great. Dude, not to get off topic, do you see that they're going to air the uh, UF, uh, Tough Brazil on, uh, on Fuel too? Uh, they are. I was hoping that. I was, I was actually going to – that was one of my other notes I was going to bring up because I know the other one's starting this week, but – um, I wanted to know about that show because that's going to be freaking great. They got, uh, you know, Vanderlei and Vitor Belfort, and they got, like, some other, I think Verdum is the jiu-jitsu coach for one of them. Like, they got some big wow. guys in there, even as assistant coaches. So, uh, like, I want to see that show. No great. shit, really. No, yeah, that's that's awesome. Like, I read that last week. Uh, I, I, I either mentioned it last Monday or last Wednesday. But, uh, you know, I, I think that's pretty awesome. I'm hoping Comcast gets the shit straight now and they, 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 they put fuel up because, obviously, between the fight cards and now this, I, I really, you know, I'm, it really pisses me off that, 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 that I'm locked out from seeing this shit because I think that that, that tough might even have more potential than, than this one. I mean, this one is very interesting because it's going to be live and stuff, but, you know, Dominic Cruz and, and Uriah Faber, uh, I think that could go either way. They're either going to be – you know, at each other all the time and make it interesting, or they're they're going to be pretty boring overall because I've never seen Dominic Cruz talk with any passion when he's like discrediting, you know, Faber. Obviously, he doesn't like the guy, but he's never really been like, "Fuck that dude." You know what I'm saying? He's always just kind of like, "Yeah, Uriah is just, you know, he's always there, and I'm tired of seeing his face." You know that kind of yeah. shit. And, uh, and it's the first so time. Got, uh, it's the first time they're doing it live, so I'm sure there's going to be some glitches. And uh, you know, the thing the thing that I like about the Tough Brazil. I mean, Brazil is a huge country, number one, so there's a lot of really, you know, it's like going to the Dominican Republic and finding a pitcher or finding Papi Ortiz. Like, there's a lot of, the talent level on that show is going to be a lot higher than the talent level on the American show just because yeah. a lot of the American guys are have already been discovered because there's nothing holding them back. Whereas in Brazil, you know, there's guys out in the fucking middle of the jungle in in, uh, in linen cloth beating the shit out of each other, or whatever, like, uh, you know, <laughs> Their faces, the yeah. bones through their nose. 
there's, right, there's, exactly. there's, they've got to make a decision. Am I going to be a tribesman? Am I going to be a drug runner? Am I going to kidnap people and torture them for a living before their family pays for them? Or am I going to be a fighter? Those are their choices. <laughs> so, yeah, there, there's a lot. So there's, just, <laughs> there's so much talent down there that if, if they get even – you know, uh, an eighth of that talent uh, on the show. I mean, the, you're going to have some probably few. I would say probably future champions coming from that show, because there's there's got to be just you know hundreds of guys chomping at the bit to get out of that country and to come up here and fight and make some money. Nah, it's beautiful down there, dude. I hear it's really nice, but you got to drive around in an armored car if you're white. So be careful, okay? Well, um, <laughs> I, know I know they got, got a lot of. Uh, I know the the, uh, the shemal population is kind of high down there. I know uh, you uh, you took uh, you took holiday there a couple of years ago for a couple of weeks. Well, you know, I, I, listen, listen. You know, you got to you got to sit there, and sometimes you just got to live on the edge. You know what I mean? And, yeah, I hear uh, you. You know, I mean, there's nothing but a beautiful populace down there, and who am I to judge? So I'm, just, I'm very open minded, and you know what? I think everybody deserves a chance. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Very big of you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, the close-up, I, I felt McCall won the decision as well, dude. Um, I felt he was robbed, unlike you. I feel a little bit more strongly. But uh, it, it, it is vindication that uh, they came out and said what they said, uh, which, you know, I, I feel is just fucking ridiculous because they had that, uh, what do you call it, uh, sudden victory round in place. So if it would have been scored right, we would have gotten another round, even though I thought the fight should have been over anyway. There still would have been an opportunity for Ian uh, that's McCall a good point. to to, to come out victorious, and they didn't even get to use it. So, you know, you know, and that's a good point. Him. I didn't even, uh, I, I, once you just, I mean, that's a great point. They should have had a, a sudden victory round. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, I, I think McCall would have took it, especially after the, how we, you know, finished the third round. Um, but, you know, now who, who, who's to say? Demetrius Johnson's going to go back to the drawing board, and I know he was the favorite to win the tournament. Um, I picked against him last week, figuring McCall had more experience and said Demetrius Johnson would definitely be back to challenge for that belt later on in the year. But I just thought uh, McCall had, had it over him. And uh, we'll find out, I guess, on I think it's all, uh, April 14th that they're going to be fighting. So hopefully everybody heals up and uh, that happens. But, uh, you know, it was definitely a good fight, don't get me wrong. It was exciting. So at least we get a second fight with the two guys that you'll have to tell me about because I don't get Fuel TV. I don't know if I mentioned that. I'm a little bitter. Cool. And, um uh, Oh, but we'll move on to the last fight, which was pretty disappointing because I happen to like the Crusher McGee. Court the Crusher. He was fighting Konstantinos Costa Filippou, and uh, he couldn't get anything going against Filippou. I knew Filippou was the better boxer. Um, I'm sure you can agree, but I just thought Court, you know, he he's, could take a lot of punishment. I thought he would have been pushing through. You know, the guy's built like a freaking gorilla. I figured he would have been able to grab uh, 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 Philippou and get him to the ground and, 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 you know, pound on him or choke him out because I know Court's good at submissions. But uh, I was pretty impressed with Philippou overall. Uh, what did you think of the fight? Yeah, I think Philippou looked awesome. And, uh, you know, Court was able to, to to absorb the punishment, sort of walk through it, even after that first round. I mean, Philippou landed some solid uppercuts and strikes, like literally right on his chin, and you hear his corner after the fight saying, listen, you know, we know this guy's got a thick beard. Just keep doing what you're doing. Don't get sloppy. You know, they basically told him, this fucking kid can take a punch. Don't get frustrated. Just keep punching him and, and stick to the game plan. Um, and, and I don't think, I think, uh, you know, Court McGill will be back. And this is his first loss yeah. in the UFC. And, uh, you know, Phil Poo looked like a beast, man. His striking was awesome. His wrestling looked pretty goddamn good. His clinch game looked good. Court McGee's a big middleweight. And, you know, Phil Poo was was obviously stronger everywhere that they went. That's why, uh, you know, McGee wasn't really able to do much because he was, uh, you know, he couldn't strike with him, obviously, and he couldn't get anything going in the clinch. He couldn't get him to the ground. And I'm sitting there watching that fight saying, okay, Constant Phillip, who big, muscular guy, strong guy. He's been throwing big punches all the time. He's going to he's gotta have to gas eventually, and that's when McGee, uh, maybe in the third round is going to be able to get the upper hand, maybe take him to the ground and, and, and work some ground and pound, or maybe possibly get a submission. And uh, Philip Bush never slowed down. He, he, no. he showed showed good boxing, showed good cardio, good clinch, good wrestling. I mean, it was a great performance by him, and I think he probably opened some people's eyes with that performance. He, he definitely opened my eyes. I mean, I, I never really discredited the guy. But uh, I just thought to, when he when he got against somebody who was you know a, a really good ground technician, a really strong guy like Court, I, I thought it was going to pose a lot of problems, especially because of the fact that 
um, court can absorb all that punishment. Obviously, Philippu is a striker. You know, that's his game. It, that's his game plan. He's a great boxer. But with a guy who can absorb that much punishment, I kind of thought Court was going to be able to wade in there, maybe even land a lucky shot and and, and daze Philippou. And, and, you know, I wasn't really expecting Court to, to finish him on the feet, but definitely that would have opened up uh, uh, places to go on the ground, and it just never, never came, fleshed out like that. I mean, you know, Court, like like you said, he, he was just getting picked apart. And, uh, you know, it, and Philippou never guessed. So I guess, you know, he, he obviously works with um, – what the, those goombas up in uh, Staten Island? I mean, yeah. Long Island up there. Uh, Very long and, uh, I guess it's. Thank you. Yeah, and Sarah, Sarah too. You know, let's not forget yeah. that's who I was trying to think of, and I just decided to call him a goomba because I couldn't think of his name. But uh, you know, so I guess you know he's definitely working with uh, with them more so on his ground game because he came in as a boxer. You know, obviously he's working those skills too, but he's definitely working on his uh, takedown defense and uh, you know. He, he he definitely looked like a stud, so we're going to have to see where he goes from here. Uh, it was definitely an impressive performance, but uh, disappointed because I like Court, and, and like you said, though, Court will definitely be back, but um, I, I, it, was a, it was a rough start to the whole fight weekend for me when I saw Court lose, and then, of course, the very next fight felt like robbery happened, so I, I was pretty, I was pissed, I was heated Friday night, and then, of course, Strike Force came along, and I was just like, this is fucking ridiculous. I've got no dog in any fight anymore. Franco's pounding my, my ass in, and, you know, I, I don't even yeah. know where to go from here with this shit. So I'm, well, the good, news, the good news for you and Delicious is that um, you two queens are going to get a bit of a reprieve here because we have uh, a break in the action in a couple of weeks now. Me too. Uh, we got me and the uh, show, so, you know, I was, I was looking at the schedule, I guess, they do these schedules so far in advance, but, I, you know, there's two events last weekend, and then we're going four or five weeks without an event, so it's just a bit frustrating that the Ultimate Fire is starting up. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to fill content on our show. I just, you know, I like the live events on the weekend. I'm hoping maybe, you know, there's a good boxing match here or there because I, I like boxing as well. I wanted to, um, did you hear about the Dana White sort of had another falling out with Strike Force with the Showtime people? Did you read yeah. about that? Yes, so I did. Basically, I mean, basically, just for the people uh, that are, yeah, okay. So the people um, that are listening, we, Dana White, when they first bought Strike Force, um, you know, there was apparently somebody at Showtime that he didn't get along with, so he didn't really, wasn't really involved in the negotiations. He wasn't going to be involved with the brand at all. It was sort of going to be Lorenzo and Zufa, and it was just more of a business decision. Then it started coming out, and then the Strike Force Showtime contract was up, and everybody thinks, okay, you know, they're not going to renew. Dana's going to take this thing over, or they're just going to, you know, dissolve uh, the organization. To everybody's surprise, Zufa re-signed uh, the Strike Force contract with Showtime, so now they're back in business with Showtime, and, you know, Dana's still not really involved. Then word comes out about a month or two ago, Dana says, you know, just got back from a meeting with Showtime. You know, I'm going to get my hands all over this thing. Uh, there's a lot of positive changes that I can make for Strike Force, and they're going to let me take control of it. And, uh, you know, everybody thinks, okay, we're going to see a new strike force. Dana is going to be running this as well. And then it just came out, you know, within the last few days that Dana basically uh, suggested a bunch of things as far as, um, you know, the, the production of the show goes. And uh, they had a meeting with Showtime, and, and he made this presentation as to all, this, all these things that should change. And the long and short of it was they didn't make any of the changes that he suggested. And, you know, now he's taking his ball and he's going home. And he basically said, listen, I have another job with the UFC. I should have never been able, I should have never been even trying to do this. Uh, I have my job with the UFC. This guy fucking wasted my time uh, taking this meeting, and, and, and I put all this work into all these changes, and the guy didn't even consider any of them. And he actually had planned on going to this Columbus, Ohio event instead of the UFC in Australia. And he even said in the interview, he said, listen, you know, I was about to miss my first, you know, UFC show in 10 years. To go to the Strike Force show, and once I got word back from these guys at Showtime, I, I blew that show off and I went to Australia. So, uh, it's, to me, this is the beginning of the end for Strike Force. Once this contract is up with Showtime, I think, uh, you know, if it's staying white off now, I don't think he's going to renew with them. What do you think? One of us is in deep trouble. Well, absolutely, dude. Strike Force is in deep trouble. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's definitely uh, not like you had to wait through my entire long. You had to wait through my entire long-winded monologue. You are probably just the whole time just waiting to push that button. <laughs> I'm just waiting here to go. <gasps> and then I just hit the button. You know what I'm saying? Because I was like, oh, this is my chance. This is my chance. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. But, uh, dude, apparently, apparently, like, Dana, uh, with the meeting that you were talking about, even though uh, he had a whole list of shit that he wanted done differently uh, on a production standpoint and everything, and uh, basically, as soon as, you know, uh, he, he went and obviously he had to go to Japan, he had to go to uh, Australia and everything, the people at uh, Showtime basically said, no, nah, the hell with this, we're not doing it, we're going back to, to the way that we want to do things, and like you said, he said, fuck this, I'm 100%. UFC, I, you know, I don't have time for this. I, I want to focus on a product that I know is proven. And like you said, dude, it, it's definitely over for Strike Force. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. You know, and, uh, you know, I just wanted to fit those two things in, really. But, you know, they, they, uh... <laughs> you know, but, uh... He probably could have done a lot of great things, man. I mean, look at what they've done with the UFC. It came from nowhere, you know, just from a marketing standpoint, from just a production standpoint. Um, and Strike Force, you know, it it, uh, it was a great event, don't get me wrong, but, you know, it, it just didn't have the same feel. Even the camera angles and all that kind of shit just weren't where, you know, we watch a lot of fights, you know, we're kind of used to, especially UFC, just the, 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 the production on it with the camera crews and everything is just simply amazing most of the time. Very rarely do you get a bad shot. You know, there's a lot of shots behind judges and stuff on Saturday. So, you know, I, I think uh, the, the proof is there that they really could have used him working hand-in-hand -hand with them to, to help out. And uh, it, it's only a matter of time before Strike Force gets folded up. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, you really said it all there. Um, Dana White also, there was an interview. Which one? Uh, this one? one of us is in deep trouble. <laughs> Which one do you like better? Your son of a bitch. How are you? <laughs> What's that? <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said. That's the best. Uh, they got the Arnold, the Arnold soundboard, and uh, people always make uh, prank phone calls. Somebody would answer, hey, hello, this is whatever. I mean, Tony <laughs> Peach stuff. And they hit the button. That's exactly you right. son of a bitch. How are you? I'm pretty sure that's what I took it off of because I, I was just trying to find shit, you know. It's and, great. Uh, they got to be pissed because I just have this whole thing littered in the studio here, which is clips for our show. And it, I literally <laughs> just have like a, a page and a half or two pages of <laughs> music and sound. <laughs> they're, they're probably looking for their shit just like, what an asshole this guy is. <laughs> uh, he also said, Dana said, uh, somebody asked him about Hector Lombard, and his exact quote was, I'll, I'll probably end up with him, like basically saying, like, uh, Lombard's going to be in uh, in the UFC soon, which I think I think it's going to be, uh, I think it's great, obviously. Uh, they're saying also Eddie Alvarez, he's got that fight with uh, Shinya Aoki, I think it's in either April or May, that's coming up, probably going to be his last yeah, April fight. Yeah, which is uh, going to be a good fight. And you're looking at, prob you know, basically the two biggest stars in Bellator, Eddie Alvarez and Hector Lombard, probably within the next year, uh, both being in the UFC. Uh, I'm actually pretty excited to see Lombard because he's like the Mike, you know, people call him the Mike Tyson MMA. You know, he doesn't really have the body type. You know, he's sort of short and stubby for 185, but he's a, he's a total fucking finisher. And when he gets you hurt, he swarms. He's a real exciting guy to watch fight, so I'd love to see him fight in the UFC. Yeah, no, it's gonna. Be, he's gonna be excited. He's definitely one of the uh, the top level fighters. But but like you pointed out, he's small for a middleweight. But that hasn't seemed to stop his role. So it's gonna be interesting if uh, that does come to fruition. How he's gonna stack up, especially, you know, even if Anderson Silva is still fighting, and if he even has the title. Um, you know, I know with he's he's what thirty six, gonna be thirty six this year. So. Um, yeah. you, we might not see that fight, but you know it's going to be interesting to see how he stacks up against uh, a lot of these UFC veterans. And uh, lo and behold, I'm sure eventually, w w in the 170 pound weight class, we'll get Ben Askren over here too. All right, I've mentioned his name a few times, but I refuse to go into too much depth on him. Why is that? I don't know. He's kind of a laying prayer, you know. But I don't want to take anything away from him. You know, he's a great wrestler, yeah. and, uh, you know, he's definitely got the uh, the title over there. But, you know, that's Ben Askren's words. He he will be in the UFC uh, at some point in his career. So, you know, it's not like he's uh, sitting there having any real loyalty to Bellator when he's throwing out comments like that. But, you know, it's, yeah. uh, it's kind of a shame, though, for them because they certainly put on a pretty decent product, and you got all these big-name dudes who are itching out a chance to get over here to the big show. So, you know... It's going to be another organization that's going to have a tough time holding on to their top-level talent. Yeah, it's the name of the game, and, you know, who knows? 
their business model, I mean, they, they might not be able to afford to hold on to that top talent. In other words, once a guy gets so big, uh, he's going to start demanding more money, and then, you know, we've seen between the afflictions and, and elite XCs, the guys who, who bring in one or two guys that pay him a lot of money doesn't seem to work. So, you know, maybe sort of being that homegrown, build your own star, and then you may be losing to the UFC, but, you know, we sort of touched on it a couple weeks ago. They can build their own stars for relatively inexpensive. They have the tournament, which sets them apart, the tournament format, the weekly show, and there's always going to be guys getting released from the UFC and Strike Force. They can sort of clean up on that sort of, you know, Joey Beltran just got released. Uh, Anthony Johnson got released. Nate Marco was out there. There's always going to be guys that, you know, listen, if Scott Smith still wants to fight, you know, they can get him cheap. So they can, they can always, you know, like, uh, you know, they can always go and pick up that aging veteran who, who just got released from a big company, and then it gives them some, you know, name recognition. So I think there's a spot for them. It's going to just be interesting when they're going to Spike TV next year full time. You know, what's the production going to look like? They have some, you know, money behind them, the company that owns them. So, if they do it right, and if they just try to be different, they can't try to do what the UFC does and out UFC the UFC. They need to find their own identity and do that. And that's the way that they're going to beat the UFC or at least compete with the UFC because, you know, I don't know, that's, that's the key to me is just be different and do what you do. Don't try to be the UFC because you're not. Uh, I definitely agree with you. They definitely got to keep themselves set apart. But uh, we're definitely running down on time. So before I wrap this up, I just want to throw this out at you. Like you pointed out, there's some downtime. I believe there's a Bellator event this Saturday, but after that there is definitely some downtime. So I'm going to wet your whistle with this, people. Uh, Rampage uh, is definitely uh, about to drop what he calls his first hit single. Um, he's been working on it the whole time he's been in Japan, another reason why he was fat as fuck. And, uh, you know, he said he's been making music now for seven years, but this is the first time that he's felt so strongly about that his music that he's ready to, to uh, uh, release it to the world. So... Everybody get ready for that, because according to him, it is fucking amazing. And uh, if you don't like it, go fuck yourself. That's a direct quote from Rampage, not me. Just want to let everybody know that. <laughs> That's great. Is, is, it like a, is it a rap song? <laughs> What's that, dude? Is it a rap song? I don't know. I didn't actually I, – I was, like, reading bits and pieces of the interview because it had the whole testosterone thing, too, so I just want to throw that out. But uh, we got we got a little bit over a minute, so I think I'm going to start hitting the wrap-up, Franco. Um Unless you got anything else to say, real quick. Um, I just say I'll put it up against Be a Man Hulk any day, and I'm taking Macho. Oh, I don't blame you. I should fucking if I had that track set up. I, you know what? I'm gonna put that under me while I'm doing the rap. Hold on one sec. Be a man, right here. There we go, baby. That's the Macho. Nice. Right on. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody, remember to check out Roto Experts. Check out the xblog.com. Frank and my phone article up there sometime in the near future. Uh, check out Nick Frank at Hand Frank Roto X, right, Franco? Yes, sir. All right, check me out at my uh, Twitter. It's uh, Cauliflower, the number four year at Twitter. And uh, that's really it. We're Cauliflower for the year. And uh, we're, we're capping out. We're capping out. You're capping out, Franco? He's on out here.